Good afternoon. Welcome. I'd like to call to order the Board of County Commissioners meeting for January 25th. We're pleased today to have delivering our invocation, Reverend Omar Reyes from St. Albans Episcopal. Followed by that, Commissioner Flowers will lead us in the pledge. Please rise. First, I want to apologize for being a little late. I just moved here from Alabama, so everything is backwards. <laughs> but you have a beautiful state. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, sent down upon those who hold office in Pinellas County, Janet, Pat, Charlie, Dave, Karen, Catherine, and Renee, Give them the spirit of wisdom, charity, and justice that with steadfast purpose they may faithfully serve in their office to promote the well-being of all people. Guide them and us to perceive what is right and grant them and us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. We appreciate you being here with us today. We have a couple of proclamations uh, this afternoon, and I'll come to the podium to do that. January is National Mentoring Month, and I'd like to invite Dr. Valerie Brim and Ms. Debbie Bushman from the Office of Strategic Partnerships for Pinellas District Schools to join me at the podium to accept the proclamation. Dr. Brim is the director, and Ms. Bushman is the Lunch Pals Coordinator. Great to see you this afternoon. Thank you for being here. January will mark the 20th anniversary of the National Mentoring Month, an annual campaign to focus attention on the need for mentors, as well as how each of us can work together to increase the number of mentors to help ensure positive outcomes for our young people. Pinellas County honors volunteer mentors who support young people by showing up every day and demonstrating their commitment to helping them thrive. Mentoring programs in the Pinellas District Schools make our communities and our state stronger by driving impactful relationships that increase social capital for young people and provide invaluable support networks. During COVID, mentoring programs have stepped up to fill the gaps for young people and their families connecting them with resources and ensuring that mentoring relationships continue virtually to ensure that physical distancing does not mean social disconnection. Mentoring plays a pivotal role in career exploration and supports workplace skills by helping young folks set career goals, equipping mentors with the skills needed to support the professional growth of those young people and drives positive outcomes for young people and businesses. Quality, quality mentoring promotes healthy relationships, communication, positive self-esteem, emotional well-being, and growth of a young person in their relationship with other adults. National Mentoring Month is that time of year to celebrate, elevate, and encourage mentoring across our state and to recruit caring adult mentors here in Pinellas County. Therefore, today, let it be proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that we recognize January 2022 as National Mentoring Month. And we're going to take a photo, and then I'll give you a chance at the... microphone yeah. yes. <laughs> thank you um, chairperson um, vice chair and commissioners I would like to say as dr. Brim and overseeing mentoring programs that we are just so grateful for the Pinellas County government providing mentors for our Pinellas County school students um, we have right now over 3,300 students that are being served by mentors but the need is around 25,000. So any programs or any employees that you can encourage to continue to provide us mentors will be very appreciative to our students, to our staff, and of course, 
to Pinellas County Schools. And I do want to get a shout out to our previous board member, Renee, Renee Flowers. And Mrs. Bushman oversees the Lunch Pals program, and that's primarily in our elementary schools. And she definitely needs a lot more mentors for our programs. I don't know if you want to speak. Thank you so much for the proclamation and acknowledging the need for mentoring. We do appreciate that, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Um, Lunch Pals serves over 800 students, and as Dr. Brim said, we do have a need for many more. So making this proclamation and acknowledging the need for mentors is greatly appreciated. Thank you. January also marks uh, an important recognition of a month, Human Trafficking Prevention Month. And I'd like to invite uh, Tampa Bay Human Tra uh, Trafficking Task Force Coordinator with the St. Pete PD, Major Nathalie Patterson. I'd like to invite Stacy Efa and Sarah Brutes, who are with the National Law Enforcement Liaison and Trainer with Sila Freedom, and Karen Yatchin from our Human Services Department to join me at the podium. It is far too easy to believe slavery to be an incident of bygone eras instead of today's reality for millions of folks across the world. The UN Global Report on Trafficking of Persons for 2020 reports that for every 10 victims de detected globally, five are adult women and two are girls. About one third of the overall detected victims were children, both girls and boys, while 20% were adult men. As a consequence, the majority of victims of human trafficking are trafficked for the purpose of being forced into unspeakable acts of sexual abuse. Florida consistently ranks as one of the top states to receive calls and tips through the National Human Trafficking Hotline, and victims of human trafficking in Florida are trafficked from all corners of the world. In March of 2016, the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners enacted our own anti-human trafficking ordinance to help combat this evil. Pinellas County Consumer Protection continues to inspect adult use establishments and specialty salons performing naval services under the ordinance to ensure that they comply with the ordinance's notice and posting requirements. This requires them to provide information and hope to those who may be victims of human trafficking. In January of 2020, the St. Pete PD was awarded a Department of Justice grant for three years to create a regional Tampa Bay uh, Trafficking Task Force, which is a collaboration of local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies working with organizations to provide services to the victims. The task force focuses on education and training to law enforcement and the public to build awareness, coordination with support programs and resources to help victims, and implementation of technology that makes it easier to collect and share data across jurisdictions. Therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that the month of January 2022 be recognized as Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and we encourage all Pinellas County residents to join us in the fight by reporting concerns to the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office or other law enforcement or to the National Hotline at 1-888-373-7888. And I'd like to, do we have a major with us? Okay. Um, we'll take a photo and then I'll give you the microphone. Do you have the opportunity to speak? Hi, good afternoon. Karen Yatchum, Human Services Director here for Doug Templeton with Consumer Protection. Um, I know a memo was recently sent out highlighting all of the work that the task force does, and I just want to say we're really proud of all of that work, and we're really proud of our role working with our communications department to really make sure that we are doing our job with spreading the messages, raising awareness, and increasing awareness for this crime. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Stacey Eva with Sailor Freedom. Thank you, commissioners, for having us and for, and for not turning your head against such a bad topic that's happening right now in our community. I've had the privilege of working in Pinellas County with Humane Society and with Habitat for Humanity, and I am newer to this sector, but I am 
shocked at the things that are going on in our community. And it's only going to take partnerships among commissioners, law enforcement, court systems, police officers come together to help solve this issue. So I wanted to thank you for your time. Would love to meet with any of you personally when you have a minute. Would just really appreciate all that you've done and have always done for this county. You are a group of caring people and you care about the people here and the, the, um, the tourism and the residents. And I just wanted to thank you for all that you do. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is citizens to be heard. I'll call you up. If you uh, introduce yourself, you'll have three minutes to address the commission. First is Mac Johnson. Mac Johnson. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon to my family here at uh, the, the uh, County Commission of Meeting. And uh, I just kind of come to share a little bit of a word with, with us because when I share with you, I'm sharing with me. Matter of fact, first of all, I'm sharing with me because, like I often say, um, everybody don't plan to go to heaven. That's your choice. I do, so therefore, I commit myself to God's word and learn how to, you know, make life not only ready for heaven, but also ready for people here on the earth. And so I, I, I was studying a couple of verses this morning, and I thought it'd be interesting for me to hear and for you to hear. Because according to this book that promises that it is God's word, this word is honored above God's name, and most Americans kind of believe uh, this book. But what God was saying to me today is that a lot of us want to be right with God, but we're not right with God. And he gave me this verse, Proverbs uh, 16, 12, and then Proverbs 14, 12. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof he's going to find is only the way unto death. So second point, I mean, how could that be? I mean, how can a person be in church and believe in Jesus Christ that all the Bible says and he could be on his way to death? Uh, we understand that, first of all, none of us are born in God. None of us are born right. As a matter of fact, if the Bible is true, all of us are born wrong. And so if a man think you're going to go to heaven and be right with God without being born again, that man is deceiving himself. So here's the day. God is saying, man, I'm letting everything happen in this crazy world here so you guys can see your need for me. That's all God is doing today. God wants each one of us to see our need for him. How do you do that? You be born again. Born again, what's that? Well, just like you were born in your mother's, from your mother's womb in the beginning, it's the same way to be born again in God's spirit. So you receive that spirit, and then Christ come into you, and then you're qualified to walk with God. So I'm kind of preaching to myself because I do plan to go to heaven, and I want to see all you guys there with me, so that means you got to believe too. So, so uh, don't be on that way to seem right. The way it seems right is you don't recognize the report that God has given. What is the report? Is that Christ, his son, died for all of our sins. It's, thank you. God bless you. And think about that way to seem right. Thank you. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Hi. Good afternoon, commissioners. David Ballard Geddes, Jr., I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Article 3, Section 2 of this Constitution contrasts an original jurisdiction with that of a maritime jurisdiction, stating that this Constitution 
is to rise from under this Constitution as of fact, which in turn makes this Constitution in hindsight to be viewed retrospectively as a bill of attainder, a letter of marquee, a hold recognized as a reprisal. Hypocritically, this Constitution is in violation in and of itself, conflicting itself in Article 1, Section 9, and 10, throwing the entire political establishment into a state of constitutional chicanery. This governmental being being based in less than an efficient government in Article 7 in a maritime act of self-evident political fraud, bigotry, sacrilege, and blasphemy, the supplanting of such governmental indignation is a high seas constitutional crime. In the course of time, this government here held in secrecy in Article 1, Section 5, multi-generationally propagated, assailed by George Washington, encompassed in his farewell address, recognized as a ship of war in Article 1, Section 10, birthing itself as a despotic water jurisdiction under the 14th Amendment, using maritime law tyrannically in pursuit of disestablishing the religion of Christianity as based on the reclaimed water variants, this maritime tact legally navigated on a defective constitution, having fallen into default, hoping to twice double down on its deception, is beyond a reasonable doubt not a legitimate government as of 246 years ago, and such political powers shall not be binding upon this land. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Gettys. Vincent Nowicki. I think he's coming from the other room. And after Mr. Nowicki, Tom Timsick. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry for making y'all wait uh, 30 seconds. I apologize. Uh, but thanks for having me here today. Uh, so first, I'd just like to start off by saying, imagine you all were employers uh, and that you're, uh, you gave a request to an employee over two-week period. Now imagine you got 200 requests over two weeks to your email to implement term limits. You've gotten emails, Commissioner Seals gotten emails, Commissioner Eggers has gotten emails, Chair Justice has gotten emails, Vice Chair Long has got emails, Commissioner Flowers has got emails, and Commissioner Peters has gotten emails. 200 requesting term limits in two weeks, in two weeks. So imagine you break that across a year, almost every single day you get an email asking you to do something and you don't do it. Why should you still have a job? And I think that's going to become an issue this year. Some of you are up for election, Commissioner Gerard. So I think you're going to have to explain that to the voters. One of my favorite quotes was made famous by John F. Kennedy. And he says, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who remain neutral in time of conflict. Commissioner Gerard, you served as a advocate for people for 40 years who were abused, mental health. Where's that same passion for implementing term limits that the voters voted on in 1996? Commissioner Seal, you won an award in 1979 from the University of Florida for your leadership. Commissioner Eggers, you lived in South America where you saw corruption firsthand by people that have been in office forever. Commissioner Justice, the Times said two years ago, you break the mold of a regular politician. You can build consensus and you serve the people. Where's that same mold of a politician? 
do I have to put these 200 requests on your car? Do I have to, you know, if I see at Bascom's Chop House, do I have to, you know, say, hey, you know, term limits, you know? So what do I have to do? What more of a crystal clear message do the residents have to give? You all leave a legacy when you're done and we move on and we retire. What do you want that legacy to be? George Washington left a legacy of stepping down and doing the right thing. And then you have another legacy. Vladimir Putin is going to live a legacy of invasion, tyranny, and corruption. Do the right thing. Leave a good legacy. Listen to the residents. Thank you for your time. Tom Timsik. Tom Timsik. For the record, my name is Tom Timchek, and I had to take a day off from work to come here to talk to you people. Back in 1996, term limits was voted on for Pinellas County Commissioners, and it passed overwhelmingly. Yet for some reason that I don't know and nobody else seems to know, it was never enacted. We now have a chance to put that on the ballot again, and I think we should. I've heard some of you commissioners say that the majority of Pinellas County residents are happy with it the way it is and don't want to change it. Well, that's great. Put it on the ballot, and they'll leave it alone. They'll vote for you guys who get your way. That's all I'm saying is put it on the ballot, let the voters decide of Pinellas County. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Julie Vane. Julie Vane. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm back. I'll be back. This is passionate to me. I brought a bunch of friends, and my friends, they're going to bring friends next week, or two weeks from now, excuse me, when you meet again. And we're going to keep bringing friends, and we're going to keep coming back, and we're going to keep petitioning the Board of County Commissioners for term limits. All we're asking for you to do is to put it on the ballot. You can do it. We're asking you to do something like that. Now, as you know, 96, the referendum was called Eight is Enough. And I was here back in December, early December, talking to you about, you know, putting it on. And you all talked about 12 years was a suggestion. And it fell on deaf ears. Through the conversations, even one of, one of your members said uh, that the topic was so dead that it was like putting, sewing a coat on a button. Well, I tell you what you've done is you've suppressed the will of the people. Yeah. It's voter suppression. You've put a coat over the vote in 1996 and said it didn't happen, it doesn't exist, the people don't want it. They do. They don't want their will suppressed. And there's nothing about it. 73% of the voters said that's what they wanted, eight years. Through all the legal machinations, all the court battles, here we sit, 26 years later. Simply ask the voters again. I don't know if you're how, how aware you are of how unpopular you are in the faith, family happenings around the community, what you all have done to our lives. You know the people that were here a year ago, two years ago about mask mandates and everything else. They're not gonna stand for this. They're not going to stand for you all ignoring the will of the people. When I was here a couple weeks ago, you all were touting about your pledge for Ready for 100. I went home and did a little research. You signed on with the Sierra Club and made a commitment to, let's see here, power communities with 100% clean renewable energy. Have you asked the voters? Is that what they want? Do they want 100% clean, renewable energy to be 50% there in the next eight years? Is that what they want? I haven't heard anybody in the community talking about it, but you all are going forward like it's what our will is. It's not our will. You haven't asked us. You're pushing utilities to switch to more clean energy, powering city-owned buildings with renewables, prioritizing energy efficient Efficiency to reduce energy waste with community workshops, weatherization, low-income homes, on and on again. 100%. It's got to stop. Listen to the will of the people. 
Thank you. Greg Pound. Greg Pound. Greg Pound, Largo, Florida. Um, this comes out of Psalms chapter 9, verse um, 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and the nation that forgets God. You know, it's obvious, folks, that these people control all the money in Pinellas County. You're talking about millions, millions of dollars. Just think about Pinellas County, how big it is. Your county commissioners grant money to the courts. They grant money to the sheriff's department. These guys are dealing with millions and millions of dollars. Term limits, I mean, I mean it's, it's like these guys want to, they want to be overlords of we the people. We can't get them out of office. Anyone tries to run for office, they can't get in. It's been, a, it's been one battle after another. If you're not one of their, one of their um, puppets that's controlled by, by, their, um, by their corruption, we, we, we're just in trouble. We're in big, big trouble in this nation. We see it in D.C., we see it in our local governments, and we just see the people when they see, that's why they say absolute power absolutely corrupts. It's real simple. It's just like when we get up here to speak, you're, you can't even read people's lips. Well, these people are speaking. The, something goes on with this screen right here in front of us, and they're talking, but their lips aren't, the lips and words aren't, aren't matching. See, this is all intentional. They're doing this stuff. I watch it all the time. And this is what I've been, me and, and others have, have tried to change. And we don't know how to deal with it because we got a corrupt sheriff. We got Jim Coates' lawyer as our sheriff. He's a lawyer for 11 years. His attorney at the sheriff's department for 11 years, Robert Guattari. He's protecting all these people. They're all protecting one another. I mean, they're just, and they're, and they're laundering and stealing our money. And it's just out of control corruption. We've been sold out to China. We've been sold out to these other countries, selling all our jobs out. Um, you, we're just being set up for some real big trouble here. And if the people don't get active again in our government, we got to get, I mean, we can't get these people out of office. I mean, Karen Seals has been here and these other folks, they give themselves their own raises. I mean, they've been in government so long, we can't get them out. We can't put them out to pasture. They're just stuck here. And we got to sit here and, and, and so somehow I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I don't know if, I mean, what's it going to take? I mean, how do we get you people out of office, get some common people, some people who love America, people who are going to put America first? How do we do that? Because we can't vote you out, and now you want to get term limits where you just, we can't get you out. You know, a separation of power clause is thrown out the window. You got Jim Coates' lawyer as our sheriff, and he's still an attorney practicing law as an attorney. So this is out of control corruption. And... Um, you know, I, I, it's, I mean, our country's in big, big trouble, and people are going to have to see it. We're, we're destroying ourselves. It's within. They couldn't bring America down from without. It's happening with sun. Tom Rask. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Tom Rask, Unincorporated Pinellas County. Um, as you can tell, um, voter suppression is going to be an issue. Voter suppression, meaning thwarting of the will of the people in 1996 to adhere to um, eight-year term limits. Um, Ms. Vane put it well. She talked about legal machinations. That's where, the, where they were. If you follow what happened, Pinellas County withdrew from the lawsuit, yet somehow got the benefit of it. No one cares. No one cares how you got there. It's viewed as a shell game by the voters. Over 70% voted. And you and other agencies in the county trying to shove light rail down our throat, shove all kinds of things down our throat, just increases our determination. Presumably, you all know that this country is only one severe economic downturn away from severe social unrest. You know that, right? Um, I see Ms. Long is typing away on her computer, apparently not listening, which is, of course, her prerogative. But uh, that's a perfect segue into the other word you've heard a lot here, which is corruption. And for those listening at home, they should know that corruption doesn't mean what Ken Welsh tried to make it into every time that word was brought up, which is crime. There are many ways to be corrupt. 
One is corruption of process, where you, for instance, hold um, meetings, public meetings, for the purpose of soliciting public comment, but you don't, you don't listen to them. Another way to corrupt the process is to subvert the process, which hap happens all the time. They have stakeholder meetings where the main purpose of the meeting is to have the meeting, so they can say they had the meeting. When the good citizens of Athens, some 2,500 years ago, accused Socrates of corruption, they didn't mean he was trying to bribe the youth. When they said that he was corrupting the youth, they didn't mean he was giving them money in brown envelopes. He meant that, they meant that he was producing bad outcomes, to, to put it, uh, bl to put it uh, as briefly as I can. And for those listening at home, I want them to know that there's all kinds of corruption that goes on in Pinellas County government. For instance, when Ms. Long ran for office, her legislative, her salary legislative assistant was also a campaign manager. Now, how are the citizens supposed to know when the salaried person who's available at all hours is acting as her legislative aide and when they're acting as her campaign manager? This is also a form of corruption. Pam McAloon. Pam McAloon. Hopefully I got that close on pronunciation. Very good. Pronounce my name well. Yes, I'm Pam McAloon from Pinellas County. I've lived here, uh, golly, since 1979, and I've seen a lot of changes. At one, I'm going to ta uh, attack this from a different angle, and that is at one time, I actually was against term limits because I always felt that the ballot box term limited the person who was elected, and that the challenger had a chance. But when I did my research, I saw that the incumbent actually has an 85% chance of being reelected. Doesn't leave much hope from what I'm seeing for the challenger himself. When I look at term limits, I think of the corporate boardroom. I think of a corporate boardroom that doesn't have a turnover whereby there are fresh ideas, younger people coming onto the scene and bringing in new people with new ideas. And that's what happens with corporations that don't have a boardroom to, uh, turnover. The company becomes stayed and it's pretty much stuck in its ways. We have term limits for our statewide officers, as we all know, legislators, and of course our U.S. president. Uh, thank you, FDR. He would have been present for a very long time had he continued to live. More importantly, I think it's imperative that the elected officials do respond, listen to the people who did overwhelmingly vote for term limits and yes, fresh ideas. They also did not vote for, um, uh, what was that, light rail, green light. And it seems to me that there's a push for that to go forward. I look at downtown St. Petersburg with bus, uh, rapid bus transfer transit. Lastly, I would like to end, and I'm going to make this short, because I would be repeating what uh, everybody else has already said. I am for term limits. So is George Washington. George Washington, after having served two terms, stepped down because he had faith in the nation to be able to carry on business, and he was right. King George III, when he found out about this by Mr. George Best, who was the painter, at the time, he said, if he follows through on resigning his commission, he'll be the greatest man who will ever have walked the face of this earth. Thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Stephen Lang. Stephen Lang. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Lang. I live at 526 15th Avenue Northeast in St. Pete, and I'm glad to see faces looking up at me and not on the cell phones. Thank you very much for that. I have a prepared speech, uh, pretty much what I read to you two weeks ago. I'm not going to follow that speech today. I'm going to make a few candid remarks from things I've heard and things I want to say. Um, first, I'm for term limits. 
uh, what we did back in 96 um, was real. It was uh, subverted by technicality in the courts, as you all know, and you're going to hear that many times. Last week, there were six or seven of us today. Today, there's 12 of us and 200 emails. The program that we're putting forward is expanding exponentially. And you're going to hear more and more and more about what we're doing and how we're going to bring term limits to the fore. So my comments are addressed mostly to Ms. Flowers, Long, Ms. Uh, Gebhardt, uh, Judy uh, Long, and Charlie Justice. I'm going to excuse for the moment Ms. Peters and Mr. Eggers. At the next meeting, I would like to see one of the two of you make a motion and the second second it, force it on to the ballot to talk about eight is enough. The other five are going to stonewall you and they're going to try and stop you. But this movement is not going away. And if you think that we're uh, shallow, we've got people from all walks of life. We've got all sorts of skill sets from computer to professionals. Uh, we're not a light group. I myself have done five referendums. I've never lost one. When I pick an issue, we win. And we're going to win this one. So it'd be best if you all got on and voted for term limits on the record so that the public can see. In my speech, I was going to say that I wasn't coming here necessarily to speak directly to you all, but I'm listening, I'm speaking to the camera. I'm speaking to all the people that are listening because they are the ones who need to get the facts and the education. When we talked about voter suppression, we talk about 96. We talk about no tax for tracks, which we run with 63% of the vote. And yet, what are you doing? BRTs and light rails and closing lanes and trying to make more traffic congestion. That's just going to fly in the face when you do the pack them and stack them apartment buildings and the 2050 vision plan that St. Pete has and you close lanes down by increasing density and intensity, uh, you just make it more hard for the motorist. And we're not going to leave our vehicles uh, to get onto your buses. The ridership is down. Um, you've been hearing that from other sources on the buses. And we seem to, th to hit a stone wall trying to talk to you all. Uh, we don't understand why. Uh, really, um, you're good people, you should be good people, you're Americans, we're Americans, and yet you just don't listen to what we're saying. Thank you. That's all the cards I have for in-person comment. We'll go to our online forum now. Uh, first is Aiden Barnes. Ms. Barnes, if you raise your hand. We will unmute you and you'll have three minutes. Hi, this is Aiden Barnes. My address is 10240 127th Avenue, Largo. And I really wish I had gotten more involved before 2020 because I had no idea what was going on in this county. You know, I grew up in this county. I'm in my 30s. I love this county. This is where I plan to live and to raise my children and for my children to have homes here. But that's all being stolen from me. And I don't like it. And none of these people here like it. And that's why we are calling for term limits. We need term limits so that we can just live in this county peacefully. And I feel like it is being taken by members of this board. These political ideologies you have, we don't want it. We do not want you there to be tyrants on the board deciding what is best for us. We know what's best for us. We don't want high taxes. We don't want penny for Pinellas money going to affordable housing units all over the county by the tens and tens of millions. Yes, I'm glad that the media around here is starting to pick this up, but I've been watching every meeting since 2020 and I can see what you're doing. It's a progressive vision. It's a new radical utopia. I don't want Pinellas to turn into Portland. I've been to Portland. It's not fun. That's what it's going to come to. And with this Ready for 100 program, completely eliminating gas, oil, coal, people, wake up. They're going to be halfway there by 2030. What is that going to be like? Can you imagine? Electric vehicles are pretty expensive and not that great for the environment. I've seen what they do sitting in landfill. I think it's all a bunch of baloney, to, if you ask me. I see no problem with gasoline, but now I understand why all this money is going to the PSTA, even though nobody's riding it, because that's the ultimate goal. They want to force us into that. I mean, what's going to happen with no more gas? I mean, I feel like I'm a crazy person here, 
but I'm seeing what's happening in the county and I'm just shocked. Nobody even talks about it. Nobody talks about this penny for Pinellas money not going to roads. OK, I never voted for it. I never quite trusted government with my hard earned money. I mean, why are we voluntarily giving these people money so that they can put affordable housing right into our neighborhoods and destroy our home values? We need term limits big time, big time. And we are calling for term limits. We want representation from people who will do what's best for our county. And I am also worried about the supply chain issues. They've talked about it, but we need to talk about things that affect us, not trying to transform us into, into a progressive utopia. What about the fact that China closed down their ports? What's going to happen when we need tires and wires and, you know, parts to fix things? You know, I want you focusing on issues that affect us. What about the grocery shortages from workers not being able to work all around the country? That's going to happen here. We're going to see empty shelves. Fix things that are important to us. We don't want Portland in Pinellas. We want term limits. You don't need to be sitting on this board for decades destroying my county. Thank you, this Ms. Barnes. my county. Your time is up. Thank okay, you very thank much. You. I have David Happy registered, but I don't see him on the Zoom link. Mr. Happy, are you under a different name? Nope. All right, we'll move on. That's all I have for Citizens Be Heard. Thank you very much for being here today. Next on our agenda is a consent agenda. And I have a public comment for item number nine, so we'll pull that one. Anything else to be pulled? Yeah, if we pull number 12, please. Anyone else? Is there a motion to approve the remainder? Motion, motion by Commissioner Flower, second by Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, show that passage unanimously. Uh, item number nine. Uh, Mr. Administrator. Or we can just go straight to the public comment. It's a, pu it's a public comment. So notice of annexation is... ordinance by Tarpon Springs. Um, Correct. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Harrison uh, uh, Buchart. If you'll raise your hand in the Zoom application, we'll unmute you and you'll have three minutes. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Harrison Bouchard. I live at 1431 Riverside Drive in Tartman Springs, Florida, 34689. Uh, I was talking to one of the commissioners and they recommended that I talk this way. Uh, I'm not gonna give you guys all the uh, term limit stuff, so hopefully that's a nice change for you guys. Uh, I'm currently a student at St. Petersburg College with a major in public policy and administration under Professor Jeffrey Kronschnabel. Uh, he told me that he knows a lot of you guys. Uh, Turban Springs is great at protecting property rights. That's a fact. All annexation has to be voluntary, unlike with eminent domain, which means it has to be 100% consensual by the property owner, which is great, obviously. And annexation is not making use of eminent domain, and so because of that, the property owner retains their land ownership, which is great for the property owner. In the case of, I believe it's Ordinance 2021 20, the property owner requested the annexation so they could use city utilities. Since they met those requirements, the owner did not create an enclave as they directly border the city. And since it is private property and not for public usage, the owner just wanted to join the city. They did this by going through the city, and once they were approved, they went to the county and let them know that they're leaving the county to join the city. This is all from Turban Springs County Commissioner Connor Donovan. Uh, and this is for me. During this, doing this means that the property owner now receives city services such as water and sewage as opposed to just county services. To the best of my knowledge, the lot, which I believe I could be mistaken, is at 369 and 379 Duru Boulevard, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, contains no houses or other buildings. And I can then assume that they wish to either build on the lot and have it incorporated or sell to somebody who wants it incorporated. Now, I'm glad to see that this ordinance was passed, and my recommendation would have been to annex a property, which then allows the property owner to enjoy the benefits that come with incorporation. That's all I have for you. Thank you for taking the time to allow me to speak, and I hope I did this correctly. Thank you very much for participating. We appreciate having your input. Is there a motion to approve number nine? Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Flowers. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Item number 12, Commissioner Eggers. 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> again, I'd just like uh, for um, somebody to come up and maybe talk a little bit about um, this $9 million plus dollar commitment for two years for sanitary sewer repairs and extensions, and maybe talk a little bit about what's a very important infrastructure issue um, in our county, and people like to know where their monies are going and why. So just an opportunity to talk a little bit about the state of repair or disrepair of our s sewer lines. Thank you. Then uh, good afternoon, Megan Ross, Director of Utilities for Pinellas County. And specifically this contract is for, as it states, for repairs to our sewer system. And it really helps facilitate, you know, supplemental repairs that our internal maintenance crews um, just don't have the equipment to do, uh, depending on the depth and size and maintenance of traffic required. So it's a very important contract. Um, anytime that we have um, an issue, an emergency break that could cause a service disruption to customers. It allows us to immediately expedite and um, initiate a response and a corrective action to that problem to restore services. So that's what this particular contract does. Um, and just more broadly with our sewer system, we have um, you know, many programs underway to fund and invest in our infrastructure to make improvements to our wastewater collection system and treatment facilities. Um, so to that end, it's, it's just a very important initiative, of course, to the board and to the utilities department. Yeah, Megan, uh, <clears throat> when I first came on board about seven years ago, the outgoing utility director spoke to this area being a real problem. How do you see it today and what kind of time frame do you see us getting on top of whatever issues are still remaining in our, in our line, in our sewer system? So I think we've made a lot of significant progress, uh, particularly for planning and condition assessments, but there is still a tremendous amount of work to be done in executing some of the projects that we have underway. So um, I think we're in a good place in terms of the planning aspect and a lot of the programs that we have underway, uh, particularly the wastewater collection program. It's really gonna allow us to identify some of the needed improvements but now comes the point where we've got to execute on those projects. So you're starting to see some of those come through and, and we'll see more of those happening. But we've got a long way to go. Okay, and, and I think our sewer rates are the ones that are a little bit, um, have been a little volatile in, the fact, in terms of going up. So we're putting money into our sewer system, we're putting it into our plants. Um, do, do we need more money? Uh, do we need more funds to accelerate that implementation that you're talking about? So the current uh, sewer rate plan that was adopted a few years ago um, did anticipate some of the funding needs. Uh, we will be embarking on a new rate study, and I will probably be kicking that off sometime this year, to look out into the future and determine if um, the funding is adequate to meet future needs. So if... if additional funds can be made available sooner, you've got a list of things that we can attack. Oh yes, we okay. have a significant capital program. Um, additionally, we have master plans that are being completed and are underway. Great, thank yeah. you. Appreciate that, Megan. Thank you. We'll move approval on this. Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Gerard. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Moving on to the regular agenda, item number 16. Good afternoon, Mr. Administrator. Good afternoon. Um, item 16 is a grant award from the Office of Justice uh, Programs. Um, this uh, program is for fiscal year, fiscal year 21, Family uh, Drug Court Program. This is additional services that'll be provided with a partnership between the County Sixth Judicial Circuit Court and West Care. Discussion or motion? Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Item number 17. This is a sub, um, sovereign area submerged land um, easement with the Board of Trustees uh, for the state. Uh, this is for the Philippi Park um, Living Shoreline. Discussion or motion? Motion by Commissioner Flower, second by Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Item number 18. This is the First Amendment to the agreement with Wharton Smith for the professional uh, design build services pertaining to the lift station replacement portion of the North Reddington Beach Fire Rescue Station and lift, 
lift station replacement project. So first they're gonna construct the lift station, then they'll come back and construct the um, fire station. This has a maximum guaranteed price of $4.3 million. Commissioner Seal. Um, yes, I was kind of curious, what is the original budget for the lift station and did we meet that budget? And then secondly, um, for the fire station, what is our overall budget on that as well? Nice. Go ahead, Joe, come on up. Because um, I was kind of curious, we used to have like an OMB budget summary on the agendas, mm. which I didn't find for this item, nor have I found it for other things recently. I'm not sure if that's been a change in how we're handling things. I'll have to look at that, I don't know. Hi, Joe Laura from Administrative Services. Um, the actual budget for the fire station was 2.3 million, and we had an estimator go through to make sure, because the actual price that came back, the initial estimate was much higher than that, so we're trying to negotiate that now. We should have something about four to six weeks, mm -hmm. guaranteed maximum price. As far as the actual lift station, I believe it was about $3 million off the top of my head. Okay. So it came in over that, which about everything else has too, so. Okay. All right, thank you. And if sure. we could investigate that, because I used to pull that OMB budget I, um, sure. every agenda, most no, I understand. agenda items. We'll look at where, the, now, two things. One, yes, we'll look at it and, and we'll do that. Um, but obviously, almost all of our bids are coming in higher than what was originally projected. Well, I kind of projects, figured that was the case, but I, that's why I asked the but question. But right, yeah. yeah. No, we'll, we'll look We'll look at for that. Okay, thank you. Further questions or is there a motion? Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Flowers. Is that right? Yes. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. Item 19. This is the second, amend uh, second amendment to the agreement with MCARE for medical uh, direction services. Uh, this is our contract with uh, that provides all of our medical direction services, Dr. Jamison um, and his team. This is an amendment that uh, provides a piece for a pilot program with Bayfront uh, for the opioid program. This is $120,000. Commissioner Seal. And I guess specifically what what are they going to do? I'm going to ask Lourdes or Jim or both to come up and kind of okay. explain that program. Or Karen. <laughs> Good afternoon, Karen Yachim, Human Services Director. So this contract is going to allow for a physician and a certified addiction professional to work on site at Bayfront to survey and understand their ED and also work to train all of their hospital physicians on the administration of naloxone so that when someone goes to their ED for overdose or suspected overdose, they can treat them, possibly prescribe that, and then link them to community partners for ongoing medication-assisted treatment. So they don't already know how to administer this in an emergency room? Um, it's more of an education and comfort. Um, so it's really working with physicians on their comfort level with prescribing and dosing. So there's, there is a difference with dosing in the ED, um, alleviating the withdrawal symptoms, but then our goal really is to have them prescribe that medication as a bridge until they can get into treatment. So the physicians that are doing this now at Tampa General, which is really successful, Dr. Smith and Dr. Jameson, because they have that expertise, they're gonna act as coaches and champions to the physicians here. So will we look long-term to see if this is a successful treatment, whether they then follow up and get treatment? And yes, so it's, this is a portion of a full program. So in 2020, the board approved $500,000 for opioid pilot. Okay. Um, this is part of that pilot. So the next part will be um, working with treatment providers um, to develop those pathways so that it's just automatic. So it would be the same thing if you went to an ED for a heart issue, you'd be going to the ED for a substance abuse related issue and you'd have a treatment plan, a pathway, and then we would be um, hiring peer specialists as a pilot to follow up with the individuals to ensure that they've connected and maintained treatment. Further questions? Is there a motion? I'm sorry, Commissioner Peters. 
I, I just want to commend them on finally getting that operating and going. Um, they started with another hospital and it wasn't taking off, but Bayfront has stepped up and, and I think they're going to be a great, great partner and we're going to lose more than 600 people. We lost more than 600 people last year for an overdose and it's about time we start stepping up because nobody else is stepping up and, um, and it really needs to be a community effort and Karen is doing an outstanding job at making the connections. So uh, great move on putting her in her position and she's doing an outstanding job and for that I would make a motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Flowers. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. Item 20, County Attorney. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention, I believe it was Commissioner Eggers who may have asked previously whether there was anything left for the commission to do on redistricting. Um, under item number seven on your agenda today on the consent um, portion of your agenda is the clerk uh, receipt from the clerk of just the filing of the notices that were required, which places them on your minutes and in the record, and that is the final action uh, for redistricting. So just to bring that to your attention. Thank you very much. <coughs> item 21, county administrator reports. Um, just a brief update uh, with COVID. Uh, we continue to see very, very high numbers over the last seven days, over 11,700 cases. Um, you're seeing a 20, over a 27% uh, percent positivity uh, in those cases. Our dashboard is still up and, and you can uh, look there for the latest information. Um, slowly, you know, increasing our vaccination rates. Our fire transports, it's been up and down, um, but still only about 2.2% of fire transports uh, for total transports, but there has been certain spikes, but that's because they've been really been working with the hospitals on getting those ambulances back out on uh, the road. Um, and, and again, we ran into a few issues with that, but it seems to be leveling out. Um, the biggest news, which was yesterday, was that the uh, state antibody infusion center closed effective today. Um, that's because the FDA's announcement uh, indicating that these were, these were not effective against a new variant. Um, with that, um, we have updated our, or we keep on our website new testing sites. So there's several drive throughs that have people have worked separately to stand those up. So those continue to be operating um, along with our uh, pharmacies. Be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Commissioner Eggers. Uh, so the first question you answered, which was the site, the site questions. And so do we have those on our website, Barry, that, that show any possibly North, uh, North County that might be in, in place? I don't mean from us, but. Well, the, 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 the one that I sent my son to today <laughs> was uh, at the YMCA in Clearwater. Perfect. Um, okay. And so that was the, the, looked like the closest one to me. Okay. Um, and so that was a drive-through site also. Okay. Um, and he had very little waiting, so. Perfect. Um, not to bring him Thank out. Thank you. But. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> Second question I had was on the, on the percent positivity, you know, obviously people are going in and getting tests and they get the results and. Yep. They, they count in there. Is there a way that they're estimating the numbers like from the at-home tests that, that are shipped out? And is there a way so that, yeah. th so that those numbers are figured into the denominator so that we have a more realistic yeah. number? Are those being reported on as a positive or, a ne or as a negative? Sorry. I just look back to Lourdes because I, I don't think we get that type of information. Okay. Um, that's that's self-reported to the people. Yeah. And um, you there know, just seems to be an awful lot of those tests being pushed out either from the federal government or locally. So um, again, I don't know if they're, you know, they're higher positivity than the, 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 the general population or lower, but I mm -hmm. just didn't know how, if they were being estimated in the numbers in any way. So, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm curious, Barry, about what kind of traffic we're getting at our testing sites. All the testing sites are very busy. Um, and again, the you know Tropicana Fields just opened up through the city of St. Petersburg. Um, our testing site and and Largo, um, they're pushing what about a thousand tests a day? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they've gone down a little, but about a thousand. I mean, so it's been up and down, and and they, Lord has just told me as other sites open up and as the pharmacies aren't so backlogged, um, then those sites will probably see a little relief. But they've been doing about a thousand tests a day. So they're, they've been very, very active. But again, the, the new sites that have come on, somebody's stood those up, uh, those will help alleviate you know, some of that backlog. And then second, and then my second question is, do you have any up, 
updated uh, information or data from our local hospitals and how they're faring? I'd ask Lourdes. She's probably heard most directly on that. I, I mean, I can repeat what she's told me, but um, I'll, I'll let her answer that question directly. Okay, thank you. Hi, Lourdes. Hi, Lourdes Benedict, Assistant County Administrator. It's basically what we reported when Dr. Cho was here last time. Um, we met with them about um, over a week ago, the hospitals, and it's the same information as far as shortage of staffing is really their issue. So they do have wait times um, if you do go to one of the local hospitals. Um, okay, thank you. The numbers are coming down slightly though. So that's good. To good. Know. Good to know. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. All right. Uh, we'll have time to make that 4 o'clock or 3.30 movie, Commissioner Sell. <laughs> uh, item number 22, appointment to the Historic Preservation Board. Uh, can I get a motion to approve my nominee for the, that board? Yes. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Seal. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Item 23, an alternate to the Historic Preservation Board, and we probably have a ballot. We do have a ballot. We do have a ballot, Mr. Chair. Unless someone has uh, strong feelings or wants to share. Uh, the first person is not qualified. Uh, second, Jean Corey, Palm Harbor resident. James Batchelor, former clerk employee, uh, lives in Palm Harbor, and Corey Gibbons Jr. lives in St. Petersburg. Let's do the ballot. Item, we can, while she's passing that out, we'll go to item number 24, appointment to the LPA, individual appointment by Commissioner Seal. And also to approve um, Mac Duggan Cooley, as well as to send out a um, sincere thanks to Mr. Steve Clark for his many years of service on the LPA as my representative. We have a motion by Commissioner Seal, a second by Commissioner Gerard. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, show that passes unanimously. Do I need just initial it or hmm? just the name at the top is good. Give the clerk a moment to collect those ballots before we move on to the next one. Madam Clerk. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. For the Historic Preservation Board, um, the uh, Board of County Commissioners has chosen James Backteller to be their uh, representative. It was a vote of uh, five to two with two um, for Corey Givens, Jr. Thank so you very record. much. Thank you. Item 25, appointment to the Pinellas County Housing and Finance Authority Board of County Commissioners. Uh, there are, we can have a ballot. There are two names on the list and we should select one. One is a reappointment, one would be new. They're both eligible. Thank you.
I love how everyone folds up the ballot like it's. <laughs> it's not secret. No. It is very much not a secret ballot. Only momentarily. <laughs> And uh, Mr. Chair, for uh, item number 25, which is an appointment to the Housing Finance Authority, uh, the commissioners have chosen uh, Christina Kovarik to be their representative by a vote of uh, five to two. Thank you very much. All right, item number 26, um, before we go to committee updates and those kind of things, I would like to get a board motion and support for the appointment of alternate uh, for the election canvassing board uh, for both the March municipal elections and the November general elections for the appointment of Herb Polson. Oh, Motion by Commissioner Seal, second by Commissioner Flowers. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Yeah. <laughs> he loves, he does. Are there uh, commissioner updates or committee reports that you'd like to share at this time? Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, the um, I've unfortunately had the stomach flu for the Ford Pinellas meeting, so I was not there, but I have a summary of it, and basically the transportation improvement program was approved. They approved three amendments to um, the countywide plan, one in St. Pete, uh, one in Dunedin, and one in Oldsmar, and um, the board approved the scope of services for the target employment industrial land study, which will definitely if possibly affect the comprehensive plan, the plan Pinellas that we're going to be talking about later today. Um, a very important thing forward to Pinellas in DOT, Pinellas County and City of Dunedin have decided to install a full traffic signal as a temporary safety solution at State Road 580 and Skinner at the Pinellas Trail, which I'm really glad to hear about because that is, um, they had a death there not too long ago. It's a very dangerous intersection and um, especially because of the sunset and the lighting that's in that particular area. Um, the other news that I thought was interesting was that the city of Clearwater has asked that there's no longer be any further work on the proposed Clearwater Memorial Causeway Busway um, so this will return state funding allocated for the project. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, I chaired my first historic preservation meeting and thank you Commissioner Justice for your many years of service on that. Um, what came out of that was um, three items that we're gonna be working on. One is they would like to see visit St. Pete Clearwater start to market more heritage tourism, which I'm sure as chair you'll hear more about. Um, and then they also asked if we could update the Pinellas County history, um, which was last updated in 2008, and to use this in our resiliency efforts, um, as well as um, this was the request of the group, if you recall, when Commissioner Parks was here, they did a whole um, history book on the county commissioners as well as on the clerk of the circuit court and the other constitutional officers. The constitutional officers have been updated more recently, but not the county commission for over 20 something years. So they requested that we update that history book. Um, I'm just bringing forward their requests um, and I did mention it to Barry already. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gerard. So I attended my first JWB board meeting <laughs> last week. Uh, there was quite a lot of discussion about um, the funding for Juvenile Welfare Board's Family Services Initiative, which had been uh, going on for eight years, and that 211 had been administering. Um, right before the meeting, they asked they sent a letter asking to be relieved of that contract because, <clears throat> because it had been a problem. Um, however, that 
discontinues all the funding from juvenile welfare board to the to 211 and um, I raised the point that 211 and information and referral is pretty much infrastructure to the human services system and it needs to be there and it needs to be healthy so I asked them to convene a uh, a meeting of our HHS CC leadership whatever it, it goes on and on um, which several of us serve on and we haven't had a meeting in quite a while but I think it was getting ready to be disbanded but I'm, um, I'm hoping we have at least one more meeting because what the result of this will be that 211 will come back to the county and ask that we replace some of that funding I'm sure and I really do think that J B ought to be picking up some of the some of the uh, responsibility there so I will see if I can represent that appropriately Commissioner Peters. So I thought there was a task force that was looking into 211, and um, I think, Karen, you represented both JWB and the county. I've heard nothing about that. Um, it is absolutely infrastructure, in my opinion, and it should be operating as so, and it isn't. And we got a really good glimpse of how bad it really was operating, and so where are we? I'd love to have an update. I'd love to know where the task force is. I would love to know where we are on all of this and kind of what's the projected future. We recently, Randy Russell with um, Healthy St. Pete has um, stepped up to the plate. I have talked with staff about this along the way and they have con they convened one Zoom meeting. There's another one scheduled soon to, they've been out talking with the community to see what their needs are in the um, health and human services areas. Um, uh, during last year's budget, I actually forwarded decision packages to fully to fund 211 in a more robust manner. That was not uh, recommended by our staff. Um, I do feel a bit of frustration in this entire subject. I have tried to advocate with the Juvenile Welfare Board. I've tried to advocate with our Pinellas County staff that we need to figure this out. Um, Actually, the community um, needs assessment that you've championed, Commissioner Peters, became the relevant direction that the staff wanted to go in first, and so um, that's where we're respectfully going at this point. Okay, so I thank you for that, and I wish we had heard more, and my, my, I should have asked for a follow-up from Barry, I didn't. Um, but I, there's a couple of things that I would like to see us move forward on something and get regular updates on this and where we are. And, not maybe just put it off on another organization and let it take two to five years. But also, when it comes to decision packages, I think when a decision package is submitted, every one of us should get a copy of it. Had I known you submitted that, that would have, I would have, I would have backed that up and encouraged something different, but I never ever see the decision packages and that should be as transparent to these commissioners, especially if it's a commissioner presenting it. Um, just like mine weren't presented when I submitted them, nobody knew them until I distributed them. And I just think that if we're gonna, either we can choose to distribute to everybody, but I think we should all be able to see them because I think that was a missed opportunity. And we had a lot of extra money that maybe could have helped to do this. And that's a missed opportunity and a big one, in my opinion. So that's just enough in my opinion. But I think every budget decision package that a commissioner submits, we sh it should be transparent and all of us should get a copy of it and see it. You, the commissioners get all the decision packages and in, in addition to that, you get the list of things that we recommend not funding for any organization. So you do have- Do I get all. a summary of it? Because yeah, you, you only get, do summaries. When I submitted mine, it was a one line summary. And so nobody had any clue with the background. I mean, I you, did a whole- Big thing, you, and they got a not a half, not even a half a paragraph. It was like one or two sentences, and that is not a decision package. You do a summary, but there is there is a detail that goes with that, and that is attached as part of the packet. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, so I missed it last year, but I know at least my first year that was never ne yeah. nobody got it until I submitted it to everybody. Now the other the issue, other issue on this is this is a separate organization, and they have a separate governing board. If you want us to take these over and start doing that, well, then you know let's get then we need to really talk about funding because there's a there's a component part to that which is um, you know the other side which is when we come and set the levy so you know they they are a separate organization 
they um, looked to, they were working with us, but they were also working with uh, um, the Healthy St. Pete Foundation. They offered and set up to do a an assessment, which is the first piece. It's not always just throwing money at it. It's also looking at the way they do their business. Um, and so that they were doing that process. So we're at the table, but we're not leading that because it's not our organization. Okay, well, I think the first step would be is if we all agree it's infrastructure and not infrastructure. And so I think work should be done on it. It's just my point. Thank you. Further discussion on this before we move on? Just Commissioner Gerard. One more comment. Um, I think if you uh, watch the meeting, the meeting from um, December, uh, Randy Russell did a, a presentation about their work on this and how long it would take and what it would cost to have the dream system that the board seems to be, the JWB board seems to be talking about. And he mentioned at least 18 months. Um, so, I mean, if you, <laughs> I think that's probably true, but I think we're talking apples and oranges. What they're talking about is not basic information and referral, and that's what I'm talking about. I think that's very important as an underpinning of all the rest of the system. What they're talking about is warm handoffs and appointments and, you know, like we're talking about with our mental health system um, for the entire system. And that's, in my studied opinion, is darn near impossible. So, yes, it will take a long time to look at that. So, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I was just going to give some reports on my committees. Oh, okay. if we're Anybody, anything else on this before not we move on? Not on the new stuff, yeah. All right, uh, Commissioner Long then. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I know we had our strategic planning, and so I'm just going to bring this up because I think it's um, something we missed, and I take full responsibility for that, but it was a difficult day for me for a lot of reasons. First of all, there are six moving targets as it relates to transportation here in our county and throughout our region. And I'm fearful that our county is missing the boat and that our county commissioners collectively are not all on the same page with the different moving pieces and how they all fit together. And what I mean by that is we've got forward Pinellas, which Commissioner Seals just given a report on, there's PSTA, which uh, Commissioner Flowers and Peters sit on. Uh, but then we've got a big, huge group that's all over. Oh, and Pat, I'm so sorry, the, Madam Chair. <laughs> uh, but then we've got TMA, which is a huge regional group that meets quarterly, I do believe. And our water our waterborne transportation subcommittee, which is really innovative and very proactive in trying to uh, figure out ways to alleviate traffic on our roads with using our beautiful waterways. And last but not least is T-BARDA. And I would like to see us, and I'm respectfully requesting Mr. Chair, that we do a workshop just to focus on this issue and how critically important it is for our future for a variety of reasons. It's not just the economic opportunities that these different moving pieces um, affect, but it's also the quality of life that we have here in Pinellas County and throughout <coughs> our region. And lastly, it has the potential to be a huge public health and safety issue if we who are a peninsula on a peninsula and happen to be in the direct eye of a major storm, and we have to evacuate our county as we have done in the past, how difficult of an issue that is, and what are some of the new um, infrastructure issues that need to be addressed in order to accommodate some of the newer types of, um, like electrific electrification of vehicles and what happens if you're, you run out of juice on a highway in the middle of a major storm. So that coupled with um, how we finance and pay for all of these things and provide 
the matching dollars. I think I would also like to ask Mr. Chair that we invite Secretary Gwynn, who has a huge vision and has a lot of information that we all don't always get in these different meetings that we attend. I think it would be um, to our advantage to make sure that we are up to speed and not just a few of us have all the info because it will dramatically affect how we move forward to address these hurt, huge burning issues for our citizens, not to mention the growth that we're experiencing. If there's support or no objection, I can work with the administrator to try and put together that kind of transportation day. As much as I've worked to stay off every transportation committee there is. <laughs> Commissioner Seal? Um, not to complicate matters, but um, you know, we have done transportation summits in the past, which invite more than just us to the table. Um, I would suggest that it would be more of a comprehensive strategy to um, update beyond the county commission. I don't know whether you want to have PSTA invited. I think we pick the date and then we invite others to attend. And I agree with you, Commissioner Seal. That's what we tried to do when we had that TMA summit mm -hmm. a couple weeks or a month ago. What I find when the, those, if you don't really pay attention to how you organize that, you get a group of planners and the same people around the table, but you don't get a lot of the ancillary groups that are also working towards the same agenda. And I think that's really important that it's inclusive just so, but I like the idea of a summit as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to help however I can on that front, Barry. We can work on calendar and then if commissioners have ideas for who should be engaged with it, that would be good to submit to the administrator. Okay. Commissioner Long, anything else? No, that's it. Thank you very much. Commissioner Eggers. Oh. Chair, um, yeah, just a couple things. First, just a little report on Tampa Bay water. Um, we had our meeting this week. Um, you know, pretty pretty good uh, round of discussions um, centering around um, Hillsborough County and City of Tampa and what's going on with their new new project. Basically, how to how to use reclaimed water. Um, so uh, that is front and center. The uh, Tampa Bay Water is continuing to um, embrace dialogue and discussion and represent all six members of Tampa Bay Water equally while we try to figure out um, what Tampa Bay or the city of Tampa wants to do with their reclaimed water. So we continue to have discussions about that. In fact, some of our actions that we took were related to South County projects, South Hillsborough County projects. Um, and that had to do with their well field and some of their pipe work just to get some short-term relief for additional water in South County, but also the interim and uh, long-term uh, relief for that high growth area. So um, did good work on that front, did good work on the, um, on, on the reclaimed issue. And I think that's, that's probably a topic that is gonna continue rising up in conversations at our board meetings, Swift Mud board meetings. State of Florida has interest in what we're doing with reclaimed water. Um, as you know, we've been told that by a certain date in a few years, we have to f have figured out what to do with all of our excess reclaimed water other than to dispose of it in our uh, intercoastal waterways. So there's a lot of work being done on that front and um, we'll continue to keep you up to speed on, on those issues. Um, I think really uh, I'd sent you something about the 2021 uh, agency accomplishments already and what's going on uh, in 2022. We're talking about a new water supply project to vote on, water quality improvements to vote on, um, and, additional, and additional things that I think are related to making sure that our two million residents plus have the water that they, that they deserve. Um, went over some legislative issues that were going on, some of which we've heard here, um, some of the items of, of, of good news for Tampa Bay Water, and also some concern areas. Um, so by and large, that's it on Tampa Bay Water. Um, my, my chairmanship ends next month, and we'll have a new chairman uh, effective March of this year. Uh, last thing I wanted to bring up is um, uh, I get calls um, from our residents from time to time um, on different aspects of that North Loop uh, trail. Um, 
some of them are, and, 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 I, and I will say that uh, you know, um, we have great response on an item by item basis as to what the problem is and why we're not where we need to be. So maybe, uh, Barry, if we could just have a, a summary uh, sent to all of us on each of those phases of that project and the status of them and anticipated completion. Uh, we, and there are probably five or six legs. Um, and um, I was glad to see that uh, Forward Pinellas added the overpass at 580 on their preferential list of bridges to be done. It's only a six or eight lane road to get across and they're gonna try to accomplish it with a red, yellow, green light and an island in the middle for safety. And I'm like, you know, we don't do that anywhere else in the county and I think we need to be, that's on their list now as a priority, which is great. But just a summary on where we are with each of those phases and when we uh, plan to be finished. I know we've gotten some calls from some of the neighborhoods as well for that. And that's all I had. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Seal. May I just um, piggyback on Commissioner Eggers? Um, I think there's also some confusion. There's areas where the trail is done, but we haven't opened it. And so um, some people are maybe using it, some people maybe are not. I've been told that June, the whole thing will be open, but there are some people are very pent up in their desire to use it, but just wondering why it isn't open. <laughs> so to kind of piggyback on what you brought up as well. Commissioner yeah, I think Eggers. that was another note I had and I forgot to mention. So thank you, thank you for that. That is extremely important because we do have some areas like along Meadowwood that, that are almost ready. They're not quite ready yet, but that could be open. There's some areas up and down uh, by Countryside yeah, Mall. Yeah, Countryside Mall that could be used. But I think the idea also is, is if, if it's open, it's open. If it's not, we should have signs that say, please do not use, because I think that's what's causing some confusion and some after hours concern, because trails are not open after hours, but people are utilizing them uh, when they're not even open yet. So great point. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you very much. Commissioner Flowers. Uh, just a couple of updates from the committees that I serve on. The first is, unfortunately, um, T. Barta was canceled because we didn't have a quorum. I'm not sure if it was because the meeting was over in Manatee and certain persons may not have wanted to drive that far, but the meeting was canceled. So we will hopefully take up any action items at our next meeting, um, at our meeting next month. Um, I attended uh, the PSTA planning committee meeting of which I serve on. And um, Barry, we did have a real robust discussion at that time regarding uh, just what support and funding looks like when it's coming from the county. We talked about uh, Clearwater's request for their boat system to run up and down um, the coast on that side of town and, and how much it may possibly take to be able to uh, have that system start back up and running. Um, and so some of that information will be presented at our overall general PSTA meeting from the planning committee because it certainly involves the finance committee <laughs> and other uh, components of it. So we'll hopefully have some updated information on that. Um, some of you may have seen the email from um, Stephen Carey from Congressman Charlie Chris team, but because of the uh, federal budget moving on a continuing resolution, those special projects um, are on hold until some decisions are made about additional funding. Um, so I know some, we had several projects that were re being requested and I know that Brian Lowack was kind of serving as an intermediary on that. So I don't know if uh, you all would want to have some type of presentation updating us on where that is so that we can look at that list and if there's something that we can go ahead and move forward with based on what we have, determine if we're gonna do that or if we're going to continue to wait to see what happens with the continuing resolution. I don't know what the um, your desire would be, but just putting that out there for additional information. Um, the affordable housing conference is scheduled for February 10th, 11th, and 12th that I've been working on is going very, very well. I'm so excited about having the Deputy Assistant Secretary from the U.S. Department of HUD um, as our keynote speaker. So everything is moving forward on that. We finalized um, all of the uh, sessions and panel panelists that will be serving. So I look forward to that. It will not be live streamed. Um, 
and it will not be available on Facebook or YouTube. I think that's not fair for the people that are paying for the registration then to make it not a fee available to persons in the public. Um, but I um, have contracted with someone who will be recording those sessions and that will be available after the fact. So if anyone um, asks you about that, we are full at 153 registered participants and that's about the max it can take based on COVID restrictions and making sure that everybody is safe. So um, we're full. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that. Um, the last thing um, that I wanted to uh, to just make a comment on is that um, I am grateful for the residents voting to support um, the Penny for Pinellas funding source that goes towards a number of things, not just affordable housing. But I'm very glad to hear that it does go towards that because companies like Blue Sky Communities, who's only been around for about nine years, but I think is doing a wonderful job in building apartment uh, units that are affordable um, and encouraging other developers to do so as well. Uh, three different apartment um, projects have opened up along um, US 19 after 38th Avenue South, and most of those are market rate. Um, one of them is already full, open and full. Um, and so I had a conversation with someone the other day saying, who's able to afford that $2,500 to $3,000 a month for rent um, for those? And we know that it certainly is not some of the people who even work as employees here in the county. So um, I am thankful that um, that decision was made prior to my arrival to um, have those funds set aside so that persons who want to build and include affordable units, persons like um, Habitat for Humanity, uh, Pinellas and West Pasco, um, other developers who stepped up um, and are wanting to build um, affordable, I'm grateful for that. Uh, Eckert College's president um, has partnered also with some of the developers and he's worked out arrangements to have a certain number of units that they're um, building so that his students can actually be able to rent because he's out of room on campus for housing, for residential housing. The same for the University of South Florida, St. Pete campus. So um, it's more than just uh, persons who we look at 80% and below AMI. It's um, those firefighters, it's those teachers, it's police officers, it's all of the people that we say we hold to um, a standard of excellence and that we support them 100%, but we've got to also be willing to support that the fact that they can remain in the city or the county in which they work. So I want to thank you all for um, having done that. And the last thing is, I'm going through the Florida Association of Counties ICC program, um, and uh, I had a chance to attend our last session in Gainesville, and um, I tell you, it has really been an eye-opener uh, to meet people from other communities and talk about the different things that we're doing, and they marvel at what Pinellas County is doing in a number of areas when it comes to um, government systems and how we are supporting, whether it's stormwater sewer, whether it's resiliency and sustainability, whether it's public transportation, um, just so many of those um, participants from Sumter County and Orange and just so many other places um, asking what it is that we do and I'm able to send them those links. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. So give yourself a super pat on the back and a hoorah um, because I love it when we can go somewhere and we are um, on the forefront and moving forward with the things that we need to do and other people want to mimic us. Um, so that's the end of my report. Thank you so much for allowing me the time. Thank you, Commissioner. And I saw the email from Mr. Kerry from Congressman's office and I just forwarded it to Brian, but I didn't really read it that closely this afternoon. Is that something that we need to come back on anytime soon or? No, the, I mean, basically the items that we had submitted as earmarks, we'll look at those. We have a, we have a staff meeting coming up and you know, we'll discuss them, but likely those are large federal projects. They'll probably remain on hold until there's an opportunity to have funds available. So, but right. we'll, we'll staff it. All right, thank you. Further commissioner committee reports or updates? Uh, I just wanted to share a couple with you. Um, last Tuesday uh, in the afternoon after our strategic planning, we had a Gulf consortium meeting and um, we approved a Pinellas grant request it will now go to the Federal Restore Council for approval. It was a $3.3 million uh, grant for land acquisition for floodplain restoration and resiliency. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to get that. That will be for us to purchase land for floodplain um, 
We uh, had the Whedon Island Management Plan Committee, and thank you, Commissioner Eggers, for putting me on that committee. Um, we had our public meeting last week uh, to receive input on the plan, and um, that will come to, uh, it was a really healthy discussion about Whedon Island and everything that goes on. There's a lot of folks in Pinellas that uh, love that park, love that area, and uh, really want to um, uh, maintain and protect. So that plan will come to the commission, I believe in February for final approval before being submitted to DEP. Um, County Attorney Oversight Committee uh, will be in late July or early August. Um, Courtney Vandenberg and Sue Estrada are uh, working on calendars and they will get with you all once we have a little better idea of calendar choices for that. TDC met um, uh, last week. Uh, the takeaway was the elite event guideline review. Um, it, it was discussed, staff recommendations were considered. It will come back uh, in February for final approval, but there was enthusiastic support for the changes that staff was recommending on that those guidelines, as tweaking some of the um, overnight stay requirements and things like that. But once we get a final approval on that, it'll come back to the commission, so you'll have an opportunity to, to weigh in on it at that point. And I think that is all I have. So, Commissioner Duran. One question. Um, does anybody have the date for the uh, uh, habitat build for the county commission? February 4th? It's coming up, right? Friday, February, Friday, February 4th. Next, next week. And okay. it's in Largo? Yes. It's well, Largo unincorporated location? Largo, yes. For now, anyway, it's unincorporated. <laughs> Commissioner Flowers? Just real quick, I forgot to mention um, the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council put out their um, survey seeking input from residents related to climate, flood zone, um, and different things like that. So I forwarded it to a number of people because I thought it was most appropriate, especially with the increase in um, insurance premiums for homes and the changes in the flood zone maps and things of that nature. I actually did it before I came here today. It only took maybe 10 minutes to go through the information. It does um, uh, ask you if you're a homeowner, renter, et cetera. So um, if anyone um, has that in their emails, please go ahead and provide that information because I think it's pertinent as it relates to how we address uh, holistically some of those things that affect everyone basically in the state of Florida now. So I forgot to mention that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else for the good of the order? We'll be in recess until 6 p.m. And I, um, I noticed we have some people on Zoom. Just want to make sure that they're aware that the items that they're testifying on will be after 6 p.m. We're in recess.
Our Board of County Commissioners meeting for January 25th. We'll open our public hearings. Um, before we get into that, um, a couple items. Staff has requested that we postpone item number 35. Mr. Administrator, you wanna discuss? Um, yes, so item 35 is our comprehensive plan. Um, several commissioners um, come up to me with questions regarding that. Um, this has been an ongoing process for about five years, so postponing this another month or two certainly doesn't um, hurt anything. What we'd rather do is meet individually with commissioners, take your questions, concerns, bring it to a workshop on March the 3rd, and then we'll post it for a public hearing immediately thereafter. Do we need to take action on this county attorney? What I would suggest is that um, since we're on the public hearing that we do defer it to a date certain, but really if we're not ready to set a date certain, then there's not necessarily a need if we're sending it to a workshop where you don't intend to take action. It's not the same procedural notice requirements. Um, you know, if you all wanted to kind of be firm on it, you could just vote to defer it, but I don't know that that's really necessary. <laughs> All right, then we will move on, um, unless there's other questions on that item. And before we uh, get started, uh, this, uh, Mr. Administrator, theoretically is our last meeting <laughs> in the Magnolia Room in this building. And I wanted to uh, say thank you to our communications team and our folks that, our Parks and Recs folks that uh, uh, have put up with us taking over their residence for a while and we, the clerk's office and everyone that's involved that's let us be here for the last, uh, how many ever months that we've been here. <laughs> so I just wanna say thank you to all the staff that works, worked extra hard to make this happen for us. So thank you very much. All right, item number 27, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item number 27 is the second of two public hearings to consider a proposed ordinance amending the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan. The ordinance provides for the enactment of a new property rights element in the comprehensive plan, including a goal, two objectives, and policies to implement Florida House Bill 59 requirements. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Mr. Administrator. Staff's available if you have questions. Sir, desire for a presentation, questions, or is there a motion? I'm sorry, hold on one second. We had one public commenter uh, on Zoom, uh, Beth Hovind, but I do not see, I don't see, she was on earlier, but I don't see her on now, so we'll move on from there. I have no public comment blue cards. I'm sorry, we had a motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Peters. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Item number 28, Madam Clerk. Agenda item number 28 is case number FLU-21-02. This is an application by FL Orange MU LLC for a land use change from residential low medium to residential medium regarding approximately 0.71 acre located at 5173 28th Street North and 2782 52nd Avenue North in Lelman. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. We have the applicant here. Um, would the board like to have a presentation? No, I'm hearing no. Second. All right, hang on one second. All right, we will close the public hearing. I have a motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Long. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. Item 29. 
Agenda item number 29 is case number uh, ZON-21-06. This is an application by FL Orange MULLC. This is for a zoning change from one, two, and three family residential to multifamily residential regarding approximately 0.71 acre located at 5173 28th Street North and 2782 52nd Avenue North in Lelman. Um, this is a quasi-judicial hearing. So since it's a quasi-judicial hearing, all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in. So for those of you who are wishing to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if you could please raise your right hand. And then do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, signify by saying I do. All right, the public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you very much. I, again, only have cards for the applicant. This is the companion item to the last item. Is there discussion, a need for a presentation, or is there a motion for approval? Motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Seal, second by Commissioner Eggers. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. Thank you all for being here tonight. Item number 30. Agenda item number 30 is case number FLU-21-03. This is an application by Palm Harbor Monastery School Incorporated for a land use change from residential low medium to residential and office limited. It's regarding approximately 2.25 acres located at 1961 East Lake Road in East Lake Tarpon. The public hearing was properly advertised and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. One letter of concern has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. All right, we have uh, the applicant's agent, Mr. Pressman is here. Is there a desire for a presentation by staff or uh, Commissioner Flowers? All right, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you um, so much for the information and the backup related to uh, the traffic analysis. Um, but if we're going to office space, um, I'm looking at the numbers and they seem to be really close for projected trips, both when it was single family at 106 trips um, and then um, office space not very far behind. But I'm just, I'm having difficulty understanding how the traffic pattern would we, decrease when you are increasing the, the prospective use for the property. We have Mr. Bailey here who can answer some questions. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Uh, Glenn Bailey, zoning manager. So the residential, as it is right now, allows five units per acre. So we're going to allow a maximum of 11 units. So we calculate that based on single family detached numbers. And then we correspondingly look at what they're asking for, which is residential office limited. And it's the same, allows the same amount of density. However, the zoning would not allow residential at all. So we look at what could go there, and that is a, an office use. And this is the lowest FAR floor area ratio. So it's the lowest intensity category we have. It's only 0 0.2, 0 0.2 FAR. So we look at that and we use the traffic st uh, calculations, uh, standard traffic calculations, look at the 0.2 and have, it's the largest building, office building that could go there. And then we look at the traffic counts generated by an office use. And it's actually lower than that of single family residential, which would have you know, up to you know, two or three cars per house going in and out all day long. So it's just the standard calculations. It actually reduced traffic by, about, I think, 12. I'm not opposing the project. I just found that to be a little curious. Do you know the level of service for the road that is adjacent to that? East Lake Road is deficient. Okay. It's not good. Um, but this is near a signalized intersection, just a couple of parcels north of signalized intersection. It would have no impact on the, the carrying capacity of East Lake Road either way. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions for staff? Commissioner Eggers. Speak just briefly to the uh, designation of scenic non-commercial corridor and how this potentially fits in. I know we have some spots along that corridor, but just maybe speak to that. Seated non commercial quarters generally prefer low density residential. However, it is the comprehensive plan recognizes there may be opportunities along those corridors for certain in certain areas near intersections such as this. 
that may be appropriate for certain amount, certain kind of non-residential uses such as limited office. It also allows, you, you know, up and, down, up and down McMullen Booth and East Lake Corridor, you have nodes where you have major intersections like uh, Enterprise. We have a lot of commercial there. You also, in the East Lake area, you have Ridgemore Boulevard, where there's a lot of commercial there. So there's certain particular areas that are appropriate along scenic corridors. And the residential office limited category specifically tailored to cord, scenic corridors because it limits density along scenic corridors to five units per acre. Otherwise, it's seven and a half. So it's, it's okay. almost tailor made for these corridors. So with the two and a quarter acres there, it allows for 11 units. What does that translate to in commercial? What does that mean? Uh, I mean, for residential, that means 11 units. But That's based on total acreage. There are wetlands on the east side of the property, so that would limit that. We don't know the extent of those wetlands, so that 11 is theoretical just based on the, the size of the property. And of course, I'd have to do a site plan review and do stormwater okay. and things like that. For a 0.2 FAR at that acreage, it could allow 19,000 square foot building. However, that same, those same wetlands allow less intensity to be pulled off of them, so we don't know specifically how large that building could be, but it'd be less than that. And they have no specific plans right now that I'm aware of regarding. And it used to be a Montessori school, and that was approved back by the, and by the Board of Adjustment 20-something years ago. So it, it used to be a private school, so that would generate a lot more traffic than an office use. And the scenic non-commercial limits to uh, floors? Any limit on number of floors, or is there? No. no. That's up to the zoning district itself. In this case, it's 35 feet. It's pretty okay. short. Okay, so two, maybe two floors. I don't so, think. Yeah, the, the residential office uh, limited and the residential, uh, the limited office is specifically tailored also for transitional areas between residential and more intense commercial, so it's designed to be less intense. That's why it's called limited office. Okay. And so it's. Okay, thanks, Glenn. You're welcome. Further questions for staff? Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pressman, did you uh, want to address the board? Good evening, Commissioners. Todd Pressman, 200 Second Avenue South, number 451 St. Petersburg. Uh, Glenn answered your questions much better than I could, but the only thing I wanted to add to you on this request is that this site is abutting uh, the fire station. So, our original thinking was that it was not the greatest location for residential. And as I spoke with uh, Jason Gennaro, who's the deputy chief, on a daily basis, they make anywhere on a 24 hour basis, 3.6 to 12 or 13 trips a day with sirens and going in and out. So that alone we felt was not appropriate to a residential in, in any manner. And that's really the only point that I'll add to you, sir. Thank Third. you. Questions for the applicant? All right, I have no further cards. It will close the public hearing. Wishes of the board. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Flowers. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Item 31, companion item, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item number 31 is case number ZON-21-07. This is an application again by Palm Harbor Monastery School Incorporated for a zoning change from residential plan development wellhead protection overlay to limited office wellhead protection overlay regarding approximately 2.25 acres located at 1961 Eastlake Road in Eastlake Tarpon. This is a quasi-judicial hearing, and since it's a quasi-judicial hearing, all those who wish to speak on this item must be sworn in. So for those who wish to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if able, please raise your right hand. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, signify by saying, I do. Thank you. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Um, one letter of concern, which is the same one for agenda item number 30, um, has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you very much. I have no cards. Is there anyone wishing to address the board on this item? All right. I'll close the public hearing. Wishes the board. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Flowers. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? The show it passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 32. 
Agenda item number 32 is case number FLU-21-04. This is an application by Cypress Run of FL LLC for a land use change from recreation open space to residential rural and from residential rural to recre recreation open space regarding approximately 2.86 acres located at 2669 St. Andrews Boulevard in East Lake Tarpon. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing and two letters in support have also been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. All right, is there a wish to see staff presentation on this item? Nope. I do have the applicant, uh, Katie Cole, Cindy Terrapani, and Robert Warren. If you wish, you'll have 20 minutes to address the board. Uh, Good evening, Katie Cole with Hillward Henderson. Happy to answer any questions. Also here today is the president of the Cypress Run Homeowners Association. Um, not only did they send a letter, but she is here to offer her support. So happy to answer those questions as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cole. Uh, I have Judith Durden. Would you like to address the board? Good evening. If you introduce right. yourself, you'll have three minutes to address the board. I'm uh, Judith Durden. I am the uh, president of the POA, and we are in full support of this change. Thank you. I like it. Thank you very much for being here tonight. <laughs> All right, we'll close the public hearing. Wishes of the board. Motion by Commissioner Seal, second by Commissioner Flowers. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Item 33. Agenda item number 33 is case number FLU-21-05. This is an application by 90 20th Terrace Southwest LLC for a land use change from residential low to commercial general regarding approximately 0.33 acre located at 90 20th Terrace Southwest in unincorporated Largo. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. All right, same question. Would you like to see a staff presentation? No. No, I have the applicant, uh, Catherine. I'm not going to even attempt your last name. Would you like to come forward? Yeah, only if you if you want to present or if, no. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. We'll close the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Seal, second by Commissioner Long. All in. I'm sorry, motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Thank you very much for being here. Item 34. Agenda item number 34 is case number ZON-21-09. This is an application by Snug Harbor Lot 1 LLC for a zoning change from residential mobile manufactured home to urban residential regarding a approximately 0.34 acre located at the northwest corner of San Fernando Boulevard Northeast and Monaco Drive Northeast in unincorporated St. Petersburg. This is a quasi-judicial hearing, so all those individuals who plan to speak on this item must be sworn in. So for those who are wishing to speak, whether you are attending in person or virtually, if able, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, signify by saying I do. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you very much. Same question. Would you like to see a staff presentation? Nope. We have the applicant, uh, Haley Dalton. Would you like to address the board? Um, yeah. If you come forward, you'll have up to 20 minutes to address the board. Bottom button, number three. Hello, my name is Haley Dalton. My address is 1631 Commerce Avenue North, St. Petersburg, Florida, 33716. There were some questions that I did answer in the staff meeting, and if there are any other questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Anyone have questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank Thanks. you very much. That was the only card I had. We'll close the public hearing. Wishes of the board. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. All those in favor say aye. 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 
Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. Item 35, we are postponing. And we did have a, someone from the public that did want to speak on item 35. If there are no objections, I would go ahead and let him have his time on the Zoom tonight. Uh, Mr. Carter, if you'll raise your hand, we'll unmute you. You'll have three minutes to address the board. There you go. Thank you, Commissioner Justice. Um, <clears throat> my name is Tex Carter. I uh, want to say good evening to all of you and thank you for the work that you've done. The Plan Pinellas uh, adoption, trying to upgrade it and improve it going forward, we do want to support that. So I've got really two points, and I apologize for my voice tonight, two points to make in this little conversation. One is um, I'm with the West Clusterman Preservation Group, the group that has been involved with uh, the county commission, with the school board, for almost two years now in trying to develop the West Clusterman Preserve here in Tarpon Springs. Um, the, uh, the project has, has progressed tremendously over the two-year period. We've gotten good support from the county. We've gotten great support from the school board. And even lately, the amount of public support that we have generated has enabled us to get state support. And the state has actually put in an appropriation that will help us help the county to go ahead and, and acquire this preserve. So I just, I did want to say thank you to everyone who's been supportive so far. Uh, when I last talked with Commissioner Eggers, who visited our site, uh, he suggested that I provide you with this update. And so, uh, Commissioner Eggers, I've now done that. The second part of, is um, dealing with Plan Pinellas itself, the Plan Pinellas uh, resolution that you guys, that you are going to be approving we reviewed and submitted our commentary on the Plan Pinellas draft uh, through the Pinellas Conservation Coalition, which is a new organization of various uh, conservation groups around the county who are trying to work together and give con the conservation movement a stronger voice. We all do want to cooperate with the county in this. We read and took what was uh, good wording in the Pinellas, the Plan Pinellas draft and we made some suggestions that would change some of the, uh, I'm going to call it uh, policy items from being things that we should do to being things that the county is committed to doing. And in general, we sought to make suggestions that would strengthen the wording and plan Pinellas going forward and that uh, you could adopt. And then that would give you, uh, indeed, a more resolute purpose towards that development in the future. That's really uh, my talk today. I do want to advocate that you adopt those comments and that you uh, strengthen the Plan Pinellas plan with a conservation view in the future. And then I will also add that our group has expressed a willingness with, uh, with Administrator Burton and with Paul Cosby, the Director of Parks and Recreation, to continue to work with you in the future, even after the WK Preserve is secured and uh, and made a part of the Mariner Point management area, we want to go on and work with the county on additional future projects where a public-private partnership can work together. Thank you, Mr. Carter. We appreciate your time tonight. All right, and uh, since I opened the door, uh, uh, we have Mr. Uh, another public comment on this item. Uh, Mr. Steve Swanson, are you still here? No, all right. Very good. Item number 36, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item number 36 is the first of two public hearings to consider case number CP-21-02. This is a proposed ordinance amending Appendix A, the 10-year water supply facility plan of the potable water supply, wastewater, and reuse element of the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan. The public hearing was properly advertised and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Mr. Administrator. I think staff answered the questions uh, last Tuesday, but in general, this is a statutory requirement. It updates our programming and, and it reflects all of our capital improvements that are planned and uh, the operating and maintenance uh, of our existing infrastructure. Any questions for staff or discussion? 
I don't think we need. You, you don't need yeah, to take action take, on this. this. Is the first, yeah, the first. Correct. This is just to take public comment. If there is any, you'll take action at your second public hearing. Very good. And do we have a date certain for that second hearing yet? Do we know? No. What'd you say, April? <laughs> I, I got a firm date of probably April. Probably April. All right. <laughs> it, it, does, it does take a little bit of time to send these to DEO and get the comments back, so April sounds about right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Swearingen. Appreciate you being here. Uh, there's nothing further on 36. We'll move on to item 37. Madam Clerk. Agenda item number 37 is a petition submitted by A Investments Development Corporation to vacate that portion of 2nd Avenue North right of way lying south of and adjacent to lots 1 through 6, block 445, and lying north of and adjacent to lots 8 through 12, block 42, of unit number 1, section A, Chautauqua on the lake. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Letters of no objection were received from Duke Energy, Frontier, Tico Electric, Tico Gas, and WOW. Spectrum has no objection to the request but did advise that the petitioner will bear the expense for the re relocation of Spectrum facilities, if any, necessitated by the proposed petition to vacate. All interested parties have been notified as to the date of the public hearing. Two comments in opposition have been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mr. Lyons, you want to give us a quick overview? Uh, building and Development Review Services. I apologize. We, uh, as often happens in January, sometimes we don't put the new year on there. So this says the 21st. Um, it is, in fact, the 22nd. So. Uh, we will proceed accordingly. We have an application for uh, vacation, if I can get this to work. Pete, could you advance this? There you go. Um, we have a parcel ID. It's, it's um, south of Enterprise Road uh, on the east side of US 19. Um, the application is to vacate what is now referred to as um, Second Avenue North. This is an example. Okay. Uh, on the left side of your image, US 19, uh, Enterprise Road along the northern portion. This is Lake Chautauqua here. And um, there's a portion of developable land in here. And for those that are looking this way, uh, this is the subject area of the site. Um, what you'll see in both this slide and the subsequent slide is that back in, 2000, or in 2005, there was a number of um, rights of way that were um, dead ending into kind of east-west orientation that dead into the, the lake. And 3rd Street and 4th Street were vacated during that action along with a portion that runs north and south. So that's all of what you see kind of in the purple hashed area. What is before you this evening is a request for 2nd, um, which is the portion on the lower uh, section down here identified just below the red um, parcel here on the on the left image and as indicated in the red uh, rectangle here on the right image and so that is a 60 foot right of way um, as would happen typically in these is when they vacate uh, when it's all dedicated under one particular plat then half would go to the property to the north the other half goes to the property to the south the same example occurred um, what you'll see up here in the in the upper portions where 3rd and 4th Street were, the um, northern portion of that right of way then got assumed into this property and the southern uh, 30 feet in both of those areas was left um, as individual parcels. So, so that's, the, that's the action that's being requested of you this evening. Part of my conversations with several of the community members that uh, have represented concerns to me as recently as yesterday, talked about what the development potential for this land, in particular the two parcels um, that are to the north. These are both on this par parcel here and the one just above that, and what may come of those properties. And quite frankly, that's not for our speculation at this point in time. Really the request in front of you this evening is whether or not 
there is a public interest in maintaining the existing right of way that represents Second Avenue. And as you heard in the in the introduction, all of those um, public utilities have been queried and nobody has an interest in maintaining that. There was some discussion about whether or not public access can be provided to the lake. Um, and as you'll see in the right of way right now, the right of way does not extend entirely to the lake. So there is private property that separates the, the public right of way from the, the lake edge and water body. So they would still require, um, you know, the ability to go over private property, which we don't have the authority to grant. The other points of concern that got brought up by some of the community members was just the um, environmental and preservation component of that. What you'll, what you'll see in this image, um, the lake has a preservation designation that roughly comes about two thirds of the property. So all of this is in preservation. And so the concern is the protection of that environmental and natural resources there. And again, that would be subject to any future development proposal should one come before us. So the item before you tonight is really just the, the vacation of the right of way. This is an example uh, or photograph of that looking, standing out on first looking um, towards the east, the lake would be in the background behind all the foliage that you see there. And then we also took the opportunity to kind of walk down that right away. So as you can tell, it's unimproved. Um, it's in a natural state um, and th there are no current plans for development at this point in time. Um, this is a, just reiterating what I said earlier. We've queried everybody. We've gone through the process of, um, as you know, is typical, we do a pre-application meeting. We go through that full submittal and we're here before you this evening um, to answer any questions that you may have. But our recommendation as it exists today is to vacate and grant the request for the vacation of the right-of-way. So happy to answer any questions that you might have. Commissioner Eggers. You spoke about uh, the properties to the north and how they were split and how that vacation was split between the requ requesting entity and the group to the south. Why are we not, did we approach the owner to the south um, to see if, if he had any interest in taking the, the southern half of that vacation? It defaults by, by order of law, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the attorney, but when, when the dedication comes from the same plat um, and there are subject properties involved, by default, what it does is it splits and then it goes to the adjoining property. So that individual is, is granted that property, quite frankly, as a result of this action. They, you know, they are oh. not a party to it. So, okay, so, the, so this granting of the vacation is simply that, and it goes to the two property owners. Right. Okay. All right. So if, you, if you'll see up here where 3rd Street is and where 4th Street is, you can see a small rectangular piece here. That right away extended all the way out here to 1st. The northern portion of that 30 feet got assumed into this property where this home is here. The southern portion of it was uh, an independent parcel it happens to be owned by the same individuals that own this property and the, the one north of the right of way tonight. So there, there's an opportunity to assemble some of those pieces. The other point I should mention that I, I didn't is that um, much of the property with the exception of this property here that's on the east side of First, which is the north south street, is unincorporated Pinellas County. The balance of the, the properties on the west side are in the city of Clearwater. So there's entirely a possibility if some development were to come forward in the future that they would be required to annex into the city as a result. So we may not see the resulting development proposal should one come. Further questions? All right, we have uh, several speakers and I have no blue cards for anyone on this item here in person. Um, and I don't have anything that indicates the applicant. Okay. Are you the applicant? All right, let me get, uh, I think, I think there is, and we need to get a card filled out for you before you speak. Um, Blake, do you know, was Mr. Polling with the law firm, is he the app representing the applicant? All right. Let's go to our Zoom line and Matthew Polling, 
with Trenum Law, if you would raise your hand and we'll unmute you and you'll have Mr. Poling. Yep, I'm here. Are you representing, are you the applicant? Yep, this is Matt Poling at Trenum, uh, 200 Central Avenue, St. Petersburg. Um, I represent the applicant. Um, happy to answer any questions, but I, I think Blake has kind of explained what's going on here. Um, it's a dead end right of way undeveloped. Um, my client owns the property to the north, the property to the south. We have reached out to them. They've consented to the vacation. And like Blake explained, half the half the right of way will go to the property to the south, half goes to the property to the north. Um, I had seen some comments um, that were submitted in objection that were commenting about zero lot lines and non-conforming lots. I can tell you that what my client is looking at doing with the property to the north is three single family lots, 90 feet wide, uh, fully compliant with the county's code. And they do intend to stay within the county if they can. Um, they will not be zero lot line lots. Um, you know, they're large estate size lots. Um, there was also some comments about wetlands. There are some wetlands on the east side of the property along the edge of the lake. Um, my client is not intending to impact wetlands at all. Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, the structures, the homes will fully comply with the county's wetland buffering requirements. Um, so as far as we're concerned, um, th this is not gonna be a negative impact on, on the lake or the surrounding area. Um, happy to answer any questions that you may have, otherwise we could urge your approval, thanks. Questions for the applicant? All right, thank you, Mr. Poling. If you'll hang on the line, uh, we might come back to you. Um, also testifying is a Ron B. Miller. Uh, I'm assuming that is last of 8922 is your phone number. If you'll uh, raise your hand in the Zoom application or press star nine so that we can unmute you to speak on this item. All right, if you'll unmute. And sir, you might have to press star six to unmute from the telephone line. That work? Hello? Yes, please introduce yourself and you'll have three minutes. Oh, hello. Um, this is Ron B. Miller. I'm, uh, my address is 2880 Union Street in Clearwater. I'm actually the applicant. Mr. Poling is my attorney and, and um, I think I already took my part. So um, I'm available if there are any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. B. Miller. All right, um, we'll go back to our Zoom. Uh, Don Sutton, if you'll raise your hand, we'll unmute you and you'll have three minutes. There you go, Mr. Can you, Sutton. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You have three minutes to address the board. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Don Sutton, and I'm the property owner directly across First Street East from this proposed acre. I've lived here for over 20 years, as, as in most of my neighbors. I'm here today to oppose the proposed vacation of 2nd Avenue North because it is the last and only public access to the Lake Chautauqua from the west side of the lake. Myself and others use this seasonment to walk our dogs and enjoy the nature on the adjacent property to the north that has been vacant for 50 years or more. It is common to see sandhill cranes, deer, rabbit, and then at night, at night bobcats and coyotes. Eagles have been witnessed some of the 100-year-old trees on their property as well. I have to ask the developer what his intentions are by vacating. Is it to gain more land that he can use in his calculation to squeeze more houses on the small piece of land north of 2nd Avenue North? I believe that by vacating 2nd Avenue North, that is just the beginning of the end for our little unique piece of old Florida that myself and all my neighbors bought into over 20 years ago. There are only seven homes in our little unique area. It's very quiet, peaceful, with a lot of nature. I've heard the developer would build four houses if the proposed vacation is granted, increasing our current neighborhood by about 60%. Without the vacation, he can barely fit two houses since the property floods badly. It has a large conservation area. 
We are concerned about the huge increase in traffic for these little roads. First Street East is more of a lane than a street, as it is only 12 foot wide. We are also concerned that the, by vacating this, it will forever change our unique part of Pinellas County and what we have all enjoyed. Some of us have been here 40 years. I ask that you deny this vacation because of the concerns I have outlined for you today. Thank you. And by the way, the property is 200 foot wide with a 30 foot easement, it would have 230, 260 on the other side. So if he's building three houses at three times 90 is 270, right? And he doesn't have enough room. Also, Exhibit A is incorrect, in my opinion. If you check that out, he's got Second Avenue North separating his property. The parcels to the south actually belong on the north, abutting those other parcels. That's my comment. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Next is Jane Sutton. You'll raise your hand. We can unmute you. Good evening. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Jane Sutton. Um, I am Don Sutton's wife. We live directly across the street from the property. Um, I wanted to point out that in the owner's petition, he did mark that he wanted to prohibit unwanted use of the area and use the space for future development, which really set up the red flags for us. I know it's standard on the form. Um, as my husband stated, this property is filled with protected vegetation, preservation land, many different animals. Our neighborhood is not a subdivision. It's a group of unique homes and, and oversized lots. This objection to this small right away may not seem like a big deal to you, but approving the vacation could result in the owner having the ability to build more houses than what he's telling you. So that's what this is. This is a gateway to something else. He may be saying now that we, this is what our plan is. However, if we give him the opportunity to build more, he way overpaid for this piece of property, he's gonna build more. So, and if he is going to stay in the county, I believe he's gonna have to put septic tanks, which probably doesn't go well with the preservation area. So I'm asking you to please not approve this vacation. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Next is Nancy Kane in the Zoom application. And if we'll unmute. Ms. Kane, if you'll unmute uh, in the Zoom application. There we go. No, we're, gonna, we're gonna say no comment at this time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and then last I have is Gina Signor. Apologize for missing you earlier. We had you as coming in on Zoom tonight. So glad that you're in person. You'll have Thank three you. minutes to address the board. I was in stealth mode. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Honorable Chair, Vice Chair, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to allowing me to speak uh, on my behalf. Uh, I'm the property owner uh, at the, for the property located at 2677 3rd Avenue North in Clearwater. And I'm a couple of houses over from the property that is being proposed to be vacated. Um, the, um, I'm opposed to this um, petition based on the fact that they want to vacate for purposes of increasing the property size for expanded development. I think that'll forever change the complexion of the neighborhood. Um, from the review of the documents submitted, I understand that it was, the, it was recommended that you approve this vacation, but there are other mitigating factors that I respectfully submit should be, co should be considered before granting the petition to vacate. 
Um, and I'd also like to thank Commissioner Seal for, on past occasions, taking the time to come out and visit this property and who agreed at, this ta at that time that this is, is indeed um, a unique um, environment with a delicate ecosystem. This, the uh, property in question abuts directly to the spring-fed Lake Chautauqua and serves as a watershed, if you will. It is preservation area that must be excluded from the calculations for determining the maximum or the minimum lot size for development. And for these reasons and the ones stated aforehand by my neighbors, um, I, I would petition that the land in question is unsuitable for development of any massive scale and placement of any more than one maximum two single family dwellings. Um, any expansive development beyond that would encroach on the protected preservation area, and I respectfully and strongly urge you not to approve the, this vacation and appreciate your consideration in this matter. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here tonight. That is all the cards I have. Um, Mr. Poling, if you're still on the line, you'll have time if you'd like to... Uh, respond to any of the comments made by the other members of the public? Sure, just just a few things. Um, you know, first, I just want to remind everyone that this is private property. This isn't a park. Um, the right of way does not go down to the lake, so we are not cutting off access to the water. A um, couple other things. The zoning for this property is uh, RR rural residential. It's a 90 foot minimum lot size. So for, for someone to come in and put in a bunch of houses like they're concerned about, they're gonna have to rezone the property or come in for a variance. That's not before you today. That's not what my client tends to do. But if that was to happen, they'd have a chance to, to object to it. Um, again, this is a vacation hearing. This is not a hearing on development of the property. Um, it's not a site plan approval. It's not a, a rezoning. Um, but I can tell you that, and Ron, my client representative, can also tell you their intention is three lots, three 90-foot wide lots. That is almost exactly the same as, as all of the houses on the north side of 3rd Ave, which are 100-foot lots. So this is not some huge developer coming in here proposing some, some kind of massive project in the neighborhood. Um, happy to answer any other questions. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Poling. Questions, uh, Commissioner Seal. Has our staff um, verified that there was no um, illegal debris taken out of this area, trees chopped down, et cetera? I was out at this property almost, well, over a year and a half ago. <laughs> My, I mean, time. And that was a complaint at that time that there was a lot of um, trees removed. Based on our uh, review of this application, um, we have not received we have not received any complaints to that effect. We had not had the opportunity to, to verify anything that has come up. So, um, no, we have not gone out and done done that. It wasn't brought to our attention in that regard. Commissioner Eggers. Um, I know this is, we're here just on the vacation, but it is a legislative process. So um, it is a, the, 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 the width of the lot, east to west, with the area that is not buildable, what, what amount of space is, what, what is that width that's left? Um, it's, I'm gonna go off of general estimates without having a survey, but it's roughly about two thirds of the um, eastern portion of the site is in preservation. So that leaves you roughly about a third of um, uplands between the preservation designation and the existing roadway, which gives you a parcel depth probably in the range of about 200 feet. Uh, as Mr. Poling had indicated, this property, these properties are zoned RR which has a minimum lot width requirement of 90 feet, a lot depth requirement of 100 feet. So the extended uh, lot depth would be consistent. The 
the land area is required to be um, 16,000 square feet. So as was mentioned by one of the other public commenters, um, they're shy of the 270 that they would need to get three. Um, that's not to say that they couldn't acquire it from somewhere else, but they would need a full 270 to get to the to 93 the, times. The east, west. Correct. Uh, north, south. So if you're looking at, at um, the street as it goes north, south, so what, what you would find is this this lot in red is about 103 feet at this at the street dimension. The same is true for the property to the north, with, which they also own. So that gives you 206 feet. Then you have this property that was vacated previously as part of third, which is 30 feet wide. Assuming your action tonight would also give them an additional 30 feet on the on the second, that gets you to 266. You're four feet shy of the 270 that's necessary. Could they acquire it from an adjacent property owner, such as this property owner, or potentially up here? That's that's a private uh, transaction that would need to occur to get to the 270 that meets the existing zoning requirement. Or as Mr. Poling has said, they have the option of trying to rezone it or trying to go through uh, a subsequent action of, of applying for a variance or something of that nature. Um, so the, the preservation comes in roughly about here. Sorry, it's a little shaky. Um, and so one of the comments that you heard this evening is they would have to not only put the any future development potential on that site, but because there are no sewer in there, you're talking about a more than likely a raised mound septic system. So there's a fair bit of area that's dedicated to, to those type of um, wastewater treatment options as well. Because of where the groundwater is from the lake, it's going to push that further to the So without speculating too heavily, what you would see is something probably similar to this property that you see up along uh, the street to the north, where the properties are brought up to the, closer to the street um, and, and kept away from the environmental and preservation areas further to the east. And those, and those septic tanks are on the street side? They, they'd have to go into doing specific soil analysis and determining that, but more than likely they would be along the side of the property or possibly in the front. Prefer not to have them in the front. They're, you know, it's like a, like a humped mound that mm -hmm. it's not always the most sightly. Further questions? All right, I have no further public comments. We'll close the public hearing. Wishes of the board. We have a motion by Commissioner Long. Second by Commissioner Gerard. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Why don't we, we have uh, no's, Commissioner Flowers, Seal, and Eggers, is that correct? Everyone else is an aye. So it passes four to three. Thank you very much for being here. Item 38, Madam Clerk. Agenda item number 38 is a petition submitted by Landon Clint Patrick Miller to vacate that portion of the 15-foot right-of-way lying west of and adjacent to the north half of lot four Pinellas Groves. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Letters of no objection were received from Pinellas County Utilities, Duke Energy, Frontier, Tico Electric, Tico Gas, WOW, and Bright House. All interested parties have been notified as to the date of the public hearing. Two comments in opposition have been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you very much. Mr. Lyon, I want you to refresh our memory. Thank you. Um, yes, you may recall uh, back in August of last year, this item came before you, and at that time we had the opportunity. Uh, the request was for purely vacation of the easement, uh, excuse me, the right of way as it exists uh, today. One of the comments and concerns that got presented at that time was that the neighbors that were adjacent to the west were concerned about um, Duke having ability to access the rear of their homes and replace utility poles and service the overhead utility lines that were there. 
So the property owner, Mr. Miller, had taken it upon himself to um, come in with a new application, a revised application, to provide a public utility easement in place of that 15-foot right-of-way to try to address and alleviate those concerns. I'll go through a little bit of the specifics to help refresh you, um, but what we have determined as a part of this subsequent applications is that that has not addressed the entirety of the concerns for the adjacent property owners, so we wanted to touch on those a little bit. So just to orient you a little bit, the property is in the unincorporated uh, seminal area of the county. Um, this is a overhead view. There's a subject property where the red indicator is on there. The, the portion that I'd like to note here for your all's benefit is you'll see that there are several homes that front onto and properties that front onto 86, which is this east-west street that's there, that have the RR um, zoning designation, they're larger rural type lots, they have horses, they have larger uh, accommodations on those lots. And very different from some of the surrounding neighbors and communities that have developed around it. Um, the properties that you see along 84th here and those in this community over here um, are all part of separate subdivisions. So when we have a little bit different than the last item you heard, when we have the vacation request, when it was initially granted that that property for the the right of way was solely dedicated from the subdivision that is this these properties here so in this instance if we are to vacate that right of way it would go entirely to the petitioner it does not get split uh in half like we were talking about on the pri prior item um, so this gives you an idea of that portion that is illustrated there in the red long rectilinear piece would go entirely to the property to the right of that it's highlighted in the in the yellow um, and the concerns that were that you'll hear tonight are representative primarily of the property owners that are immediately adjacent to the west there so again uh, some of the utilities and you can see those that exist around here kind of give you a flavor of where the um, you know, where the development pattern changes, you can see those that are up along 86 there are much larger uh, rural lots and, and have that. The property owner that is requesting it, uh, as you'll hear, they have small children, they have horse paddock, they have some other interest in, uh, you know, securing this property and not having the, um, the right of way provide general public access down the side of their, of their property, but I'll let them make their comments as well. Um, so this is a, an image that is um, looking along. This is actually from the back corner of the subject uh, property with the four adjacent neighbors to the left on the other side of the white fence that you'll see, uh, and it's looking north towards um, 86th. You'll also note in this photo the overhead utility lines that are there on the left-hand side of the, of the photograph. And then if we continue up to... 86th and turn around and about face and look south. Again, you're looking down what is the unimproved right of way, this kind of gravel dirt area with the fence on the right um, that's there. And then this is a little bit stepping on to the subject uh, property looking uh, a little bit. And again, you can see the, the overhead utility lines. So as a result, and you've heard, um, in this instance, the, the intention was to, uh, even though there were no requests by any of the utilities to um, have access, the utility poles are actually located in a six-foot easement within the subdivision to the west. Um, Duke has not expressed an interest to do that. However, we heard some testimony at the last time, and we have some continued concerns that are represented from those utility providers being able to access those power poles in an emergency and the um, adjacent property owners have provided us with some additional testimony and some photographs of showing what it took to replace those power poles and so Mr. Miller's intent was to try to address that by providing the easement in its place. The portion that I did want to mention and just for your consideration is the right of way exists at a 15 foot dimension. The rural residential zoning also has a 15-foot 
side yard setback, which would be measured. So effectively what today's existing condition is, you'd have two parallel 15 foot dimensions, one that's in the right of way and one that would be the setback. So any proposed development would be effectively 30 feet away from that white fence that you saw in those photographs. Uh, what this request, if granted, would do is basically overlap those two. You would have the right of way that would be vacated and the utility easement that would go on top, but because it's no longer right of way, the setback can be measured from the property line. So that 15 feet would be one and the same. So instead of them being two parallel, they would effectively be on, on top of each other and kind of merge, so to speak. Um, we have had the opportunity to go through and, and uh, address um, the full submission. And you, again, you heard this back in, um, in August. It was resubmitted the, in this new form in October. We've gone through um, both myself and Assistant County Administrator Tom Amonti had the opportunity to go out to the property yesterday and meet with all the concerned parties involved and um, talk through those issues. And I know many of those folks are here tonight to represent their own uh, comments as well. So. As it stands right now, our position, again, as you heard in the previous one, is not to take into consideration future development potential, but what our existing public interest is in that right of way. Um, and we feel like that is preserved with the utility easement. Um, and therefore, the recommendation stands to recommend the vacation of that right of way. So happy to answer any questions if you. Questions for staff? Commissioner Eggers. Again, I, I, I may have missed it in the very beginning when you were talking about why they're not splitting that, fifth, why, why it's not typically split, splitting that right away. In so, half. Yeah, so um, when you go into where those dedications come from, back to the original origin of the, the subdivision of the lots, whoever dedicated that land for that right of way, that land goes back to that original donating party, so to speak. So in this scenario, and let me back up if, if you wouldn't mind. Um, let me show you the, one more. So if you look at the left uh, image here, these larger lots here that are in rural, resident, rural residential, that dedication of that 15 feet came when that was platted, when that was originally subdivided. These uh, communities to the south and to the west were done under a separate subdivision and a separate plat. So when the vacation of that right of way comes through as a matter of course, it goes back to the original dedicating entity. And in this case, that came entirely from, from this community, if that makes sense. If it were, if it were, let's assume for sake of conversation, um, it was 134th here that got vacated, it would go to all of the adjacent parties because it's in the middle of that lot because that was the dedicated, that's where the dedication came from, the original development. I don't know, Jewel, did you have any greater explanation that I can provide? I think you did a very good job right. trying to describe it. But I mean, Blake's essentially right. I mean. The original, owned, the, the properties to, and I guess that's to the east? To the east, yes. Were never part of the original ownership of that property, if that makes sense. They were never included in the chain of title of that property, so there was there is no ownership interest to convey to them because right. there is no underlying ownership interest that was Sorry, ever these vested to the, in Sorry, these properties. to the west, all along here, were all part of another subdivision. If they were to, for example, if they were to build a subdivision wall around it. So they didn't, they didn't give up any land in the formation and creation of this subdivision. Therefore, when that vacation of that right of way, if that were to go through, they don't have a claim to, to that, any of that land. It goes back to whoever their originating party was. And when you think about rights of way, and I'll correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a, is, it's a, it's an opportunity to use it for the interest of the public, right? So the, so the original developer is saying, okay, I think there's a need for a public access through here. I will grant this portion of land for that purpose. When that purpose no longer exists, whether it's for utilities, vehicular travel, pedestrian travel, we alleviate our interest in that and it reverts back to whoever provided that. Now, in this instance, those properties change hands, 
but it goes to the heirs and assigns from where it originally came from, if that makes sense. But, but the entity was the ownership of the four lots, not necessarily the, that well, lot. Well, no. correct, but when they went through and these were originally created, it was basically pulled off of this lot. So it, these individuals that are further to the east don't have any claim because they don't front onto that right away. It just by default goes to the most adjacent property in this instance here, the one highlighted in the red rectangle. I'm done for now. Okay, further questions for staff? All right, we'll go to the applicant, uh, Landon Miller. Mr. Miller, welcome. You'll have 20 minutes to address the board. You can use part of it and save some for the end if you want for rebuttal. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for hearing me out. Uh, my wife actually was intending on speaking, but obviously our children weren't able to cooperate, so I apologize for that. Um, we sold our house on Indian Rocks Beach on the water, which was my dream. I'm an avid fisherman. Um, you'll hear a complaint that I have a boat in the front yard because we don't own a house on the water anymore. Um, because my wife's dream was to have horses. Uh, sorry, I'll get emotional, and I know this is why I'm trying to speak for her, but I'll get emotional as well. Um, so we bought this property. It is roughly 1.1 acres. Um, the paddock was on the west side of the property, which ran parallel with the right-of-way um, prior. They also, when we brought the, bought the property, there was a 12-foot swing gate that did secure the property from horses getting out as a secondary backup um, because that is a big concern as a horse owner, which has actually happened to us, unfortunately. My wife's horses got out and almost made it to Park Boulevard, which you can imagine is pretty scary. Um, so our, what we did is we did flip the paddock to the west, excuse me, east side of our property so that the arena and the paddock was together to give the horses sufficient space. If we're gonna house an animal, we wanna give it the best life it can, just like I would anything. Um, so our goal with this originally, um, it was brought to my attention that uh, Mr. Turngren and Mr. Bolamo um, power utility box was struck by lightning in, I want to say, 2015. Don't, don't quote me on that because I could be incorrect. Um, it was accessed through the right-of-way for faster service. Um, I was told that they have medical equipment in that, you know, that they needed service as fast as possible. So when it was denied, I did understand and went through the extra step to try to make it an easement to protect them forever. Um, if I were to have to do enough, I heard yesterday when I met them, and this is all news to me, um, that if granted, I could somehow make it private property, but from what I was informed um, by who I talked to about it was that it would have to go through another meeting. My goal is not to make it private property that they can never have access to. I want them to have access. My goal is to have safety for my children and for the horses. Um, I've got a couple pictures just to show you. I get, they're a little bit large. Um, this is my wife and daughter riding her mini horse. Um, and I just want to protect them. You know, there's their three two-story houses that are looking into our backyard. And it's not their fault that they're looking into our backyard. That's the way the houses were built. Um, but it is a little bit uncomfortable. I'm not saying any disrespect to them as homeowners or as people. I just want safety for my, my wife has had some uncomfortable situations that she may be overreacting. Um, but I feel that if this is not granted, there is going to be a 15 foot right of way that I would essentially have to put a fence all the way up. Seminole High School, Seminole Middle School is one block down the street. Um, there's hundreds of kids that walk by every day. I granted, and I don't know the correct word for it, an easement without any contingencies for the sidewalk to be continued. There's actually five properties that are not showing. Um, there's four, two of them have sidewalks, and I was one of the ones that granted it just on, yes, a good faith to improve the community in hopes that you know I can eventually get this as well. Um, these kids walk down and see a 15 foot hangout. I also have a business on the corner of 86 and 131st. I just had to put a fence up around the property because kids would hang up. I've caught them blowing up condoms. I've caught them throwing out trash. Nobody wants that in their backyard. I can believe the opposers would feel the same way. Um, my goal is not to block those power lines. My goal is not to obstruct anything. 
My goal is simply to protect my property. Um, they have complaints that I have trailers. I do own my own business. I have to have them somewhere. Um, I have to put food on the table for my family. So I do have a trailer. It is in my yard. Um, I feel that is a private matter. Um, one of my ways of addressing those trailers is I do have, again, these are rough sketches because I do not have anything per, um, drawn up by an architect yet. We are in the finishing stages of building our home. This would be the west side of the garage that I want to build facing my driveway west. No access would be come from the current right of way. Um, this would be 86th Avenue facing south. Um, we simply want to put the garage there so that I can put my trailer away, so that I can store my boat because I work hard and I want to preserve my stuff as well. Um, I drew it onto my current plans. Again, this is for the remodel that we are currently doing. Um, so you can see, I'm going to hold it up to the best of my ability and try to stay on the mic. This is the home that we built. This is Mr. Turngren's property. This is Mr. Balamo's property. Forgive me, I cannot pronounce her last name. This is Linda's property. And this is a woman's facility. Um, my proposed, this drawing is simply right here. It is 45 by 80, which is smaller than the square footage of our home. The reason I need the depth is to store the boat that they have complained about, um, and then trailers and so on. Um, so again, I feel Denying it last time was the correct gesture um, in the sense that they did have a need for that utility poles to be put back in. Um, and that's what I'm granting still. I'm just simply trying to be able to secure the property and build not 30 feet away because the way our lot lays out with the horse space size is what I'm trying to do. I am happy to answer any questions. Um, I've got more pictures that will just make me emotional, so I'm not even going to worry about that. And if you guys need anything, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Miller. You'll have about 13 and a half minutes at the end if you need it for rebuttal. Thank you. Are there questions for the applicant before you sit down? All right, we'll go to public comment. Uh, Craig Tarasic, I apologize if I Got your last name. If you'll come forward and introduce yeah, yourself. Pretty close. <laughs> Craig Taraski. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Sure. My name is Craig Taraski. I'm an attorney with Johnson Pope, 490 First, First Avenue, South St. Pete. I'm attorney representing the petitioner, Mr. Landon. And you heard him explain kind of the underlying reason behind this project or this effort. And, you know, again, uh, Mr. Lyons explained, you know, the fact that this remnant right away is 15 feet wide it is a dead end it's a substandard width um, a, a vehicle is unable to turn around in this in this right away so it would have to back out on the 86th avenue which is not a local street it's a collector it's a dangerous uh maneuver and you also heard uh mr miller talk about you know this being an attractive nuisance um you know if if the Millers were to fence this in, um, you know, you have, you know, people from 86 can't tell that this is a dead end, could pull in, or if they know it's a dead end, they could pull in and, and be secluded back in that back area. Um, you saw in the pictures in the staff report that the entire western boundary and southern boundary is, is uh, there's a vinyl, a six foot or seven foot vinyl fence. So obviously the adjacent owners have some value to security and privacy of, of their properties. Um, granting this, this vacation will improve the security of this area. It will allow the petitioner to, to fully secure and only allow uh, utility providers to go in and maintain their facilities. Um, during the August uh, 2021 BOCC meeting, uh, an adjacent owner, Mr. Belomo, at 8549 134th Street North testified the need to, to preserve that right away for utility access. And that's exactly what uh, the petitioner has done with this new application has come back in and granted that utility easement over the entire 15 foot wide right away, which is probably more than utility providers need, given that uh, Mr. Lyon also explained that those utility poles are, are lying within the Western properties within a six foot separate six foot utility easement. 
So there'll be 20, 21 foot wide utility easement between those western properties and, and, this, uh, and this petition. Um, also keep in mind the, uh, the property owners to the west that uh, have concerns about structures being too close to the proximity of their properties. Those properties to the west are located within the Riviera Heights subdivision. Uh, that's zoned R3 single family residential, which has a 10 foot rear setback. Petitioner's property is within the residential estate zoning district, which has, which would be subject to the 15 foot wide side setback, which is actually greater. Any structures that on my petitioner's property would be actually further back than properties to the west. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Mary Belomo. Ms. Belomo, if you'll come forward, introduce yourself, you'll have three minutes to address the board. I have a handout I was told to. Share it with our clerk. Good evening. I'm Mary Bellamo. I live at 8549 134th Street in Seminole. My backyard is directly alongside the right of way in question. I have lived here for 29 years. I have seen neighbors change at the properties on all sides of me. And through the changes and improvements of these properties, they have all followed the permitting guidelines set by our residential platting. This right of way was planned into the design of the neighborhoods years and years ago. And we must honor that design as it was a factor in all of our decisions to purchase our residences. Mr. Miller's property is far larger than the properties that border the right of way. His property has room for development of residential needs, such as a garage, such as fencing, adhering to the existing property permitting guidelines. Over the years, we have experienced several power outages or utility equipment failures replacements that have been efficiently resolved due to the ease of access via the right of way. Alternate routes through any of our smaller properties have proved this year to be difficult and destructive with the recent example, two houses down. They had, um, that'll be explained at a different um, voice. If the commission vacates the county's interest in the utility in the right of way, I see this quickly followed by a utilities petition to vacate as the various utilities have already stated no objection, as they will do the work regardless, but with longer timelines and more destruction of property. This petition to vacate has brought forth clear opposition from three of the four directly impacted neighbors whose backyards are along the west side of the right of way. The opposition of these tax paying residents who live daily, who will live daily with the decisions made by this commission tonight should have a very strong weight in that decision. This is the second time within six months that Mr. Miller is challenging the platting guidelines. While the commission's first decision to deny last August has been challenged again and this is disrespectful of the commission's time and to the neighbors who are directly impacted. I hope this issue can be clearly resolved tonight with another denial. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I also have two folks uh, here who would like to, uh, that are opposed but want to waive their time. Holly Turngren and Joe Zis Zwistler. Did I get any close? Yes. All right. Uh, they are opposed to the item. Um, Mr. Miller, you have 13 and a half minutes. I have no other public comments. I uh, lied online. Two of us. If you'll come I, forward and introduce yourself, you'll have three minutes. I don't have. I'm sorry, I do have that sheet here. Randy, are you Randy or are you? Yes. All right. Randy Belomo. All right, you'll have three Hi, minutes to good address the board. Good evening, my name is Randy Belomo. I've lived at 8549 134th Street North for 29 years. 
and have paid $55,000 in taxes, real estate taxes. I am against the approval of this petition. The right-of-way was part of the original plat filed with Pinellas County in 1912, the year Pinellas became a county. The right-of-way lies just east of my property. Over the years, there have been occasions when power, telephone, and TV cable companies needed to repair or replace their equipment, and right-of-way access minimized outage time. The right-of-way has also facilitated fence repair and replacement. Last year, Mr. Swizzler, sitting in the back, had to have a power pole replaced in his backyard, but with no right-of-way, the replacement took three days, required fence removal, and sod and vegetation were damaged. That was the power company saying they can get in and take care of it. According to Mr. Miller, reason to vacate include increased property size, prohibiting, prohibiting unwanted use of the area, other, and maintenance of property and access to barn. The four properties west of the right-of-way are each approximately one-fifth of an acre. Mr. Miller's property is six times larger than each of the four properties west of the right-of-way. In 29 years, I am not aware of anyone congregating within the right-of-way other than for fence or utility work. If security is the concern, Mr. Miller can build a fence like the one that existed east of the right-of-way when he bought the property in 2019. Preserving the right-of-way will not impact the maintenance of Mr. Miller's property, nor restrict, restrict access to the barn. Since all of the utility providers have submitted letters of no objection, if this petition is granted and the right-of-way becomes a private power line easement, it is likely that a petition to vacate a private power line easement would be easily approved. If approved and the right-of-way is eliminated, any new construction could be much closer to my property. As my, my first photo shows in the packet, the view of Mr. Miller's property from my family room is already rather cluttered with structures. Also, if the right-of-way becomes a private power line easement, Mr. Miller would be able to park vehicles, trailers, boats, sheds, and other portable items within the easement, according to Jonathan Casper of Duke Energy, thus increasing my visual pollution. Therefore, I'm against this petition, as this right-of-way has been platted for 110 years. Its existence does not inhibit Mr. Miller from other construction projects on his property. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, David Turngren. If you'll come forward, introduce yourself, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Good evening, David Turngren, 8507 134th Street, Seminole. Um, good evening, Commissioners. We're now 35 months into this issue, uh, which started back in February of 2019 uh, between Pinellas Groves and Riviera Heights. This issue is not simply utility service and access, although it is significant in its relationship to time and effort. Also of concern are property access, safety and security, quality of life. I think we all share that interest in safety and security. Uh, you'll see on pages 10 and 11 of the handout that I've given you, which is a walkthrough of the uh, easement and uh, give you a description of it, but you'll see on pages 10 and 11, I've given you in your handout, Duke Energy's idea of service within a five foot or six foot utility easement is described uh, by Mr. Bellamo earlier. This uh, piece of equipment uh, does a great deal of damage and is much larger than the five, five feet of easement. And as, it, as it's already been pointed out, it prolongs the time for service and repair of service. It also requires more trucks, uh, as we noticed on our street where they parked 
four trucks and two trailers in order to get that. All that's described in there. Property access is also an issue. All the residents along the right of way bought their properties with the understanding this right of way was there and accessible by each of us should the need arise or if we had a desire to make property improvements of our own where this access would be helpful. No one attempted to claim it, use it for storage or deny its use to others. I have an access gate plan for this right of way, which I got an estimate from Superior Fence back in October after after the uh, previous decision by the board. Uh, safety and security, of course, are an issue. I had an opportunity to address this with Mrs. Miller earlier this evening when she came to see me. Um, and I have expressed my desire to help her alleviate any security concerns that she has. Uh, but we do not want to lose our access to the property, to the, to the line. Quality of life of all residents along the right of way. Uh, bought uh, their properties knowing the right of way was there and available for the proper and easy servicing of utilities. It was there if we needed access to our properties for improvements or other needs. Right now, the right of way has been in place for 100 years, has already been pointed out. And unless we can demonstrate overwhelming benefit to the community by approving this petition, we ask that you deny this petition and put it to rest so as not to come up again. Mr. Miller is a clever and an industrious individual. He has more than ample room to build his garage without taking away his neighbor's access from this right away. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. I have no other cards. Uh, Mr. Miller, uh, you'll have 13 minutes for rebuttal. If you go back to that third. Mr. Chair, would it be appropriate for me to, to also utilize that time since I'm representing? You all, you all can use the time however you want. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Craig Taraski for the petitioner again. Um, again, you heard uh, testimony from the, the neighbors to the west on the desire to maintain access for the utilities, which we've accommodated that with the, with the utility easement. There seems to be some misunderstanding on what that easement is. I have the copy of the, the proposed utility easement. It's part of the, the petition package that's in the agenda. It's a, it's a public utility easement being granted to Pinellas County. This is not a private utility easement. This is not an easement between Mr. Miller and each individual uh, utility provider. If Mr. Miller wanted to vacate this easement, it would have to come back before you again under the same process. Um, you heard testimony about uh, you know, whether that there needs to be an overwhelming public benefit to the vacation. That's actually not the standard that, that you apply to these, it's whether the, the preservation, whether the, the existing right away, the preservation of it serves the public good. In this instance, not only in this petition, but the, the 2021 petition, your staff concluded that it did not serve any, any public benefit and that it, it, they did support the vacation. It did go through the process of notifying all the utility providers. They've all provided letters of no objection. Um, so we've, we've uh, you know, we've sustained our burden to show that, that, that there is no longer um, a need, a public need for this. Um, the, a few of the, the adjacent homeowners have indicated that they want the ability to access their properties from the rear, yet they all spent money or, or Mr. Landon contributed to some of them as well to put a, a six or seven foot vinyl fence along that whole frontage along the west and the south side. So it seems that uh, that, that if they wanted to have access, there would have been access built into that plan. Uh, nothing further at this time. Thank you. All right. That concludes our public hearing. Just as a reminder, uh, this was on August 24th agenda. There was obviously you've heard the slight difference from that application to the current. There was a motion to deny by Commissioner Seal, uh, and it passed three to two, and we had two commissioners absent that night, so uh, it's a slightly different situation than we have tonight. Uh, discussion or motions? Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, if staff maybe could answer these questions for Blake. me. Please, Mr. Blake. Um, and the reason I'm asking these questions is because it has been brought up by the opposing parties. 
based on the photos that we've been provided as it relates to the items that we see in the petitioner's yard, gas cans, his vehicles, is there anything within the county's um, ordinances that states he cannot have these things on his property? We do have a requirement that talks about trash and debris. Junk uh, trash and debris, yeah. Uh, junk trash and debris. We also have some requirements for inoperable vehicles. So if you have a trailer, whether that's a boat trailer or a storage trailer, as long as it's um, properly licensed and registered, then they are allowed to have that on the property. The same would go for uh, a recreational vehicle, an RV, anything of that nature. But these things are not inoperable. They, they move. I'm, I mean, typically Correct. that's, yeah. Based on my observation being out there yesterday, they were- They're mobile. They're licensed and mobile, road ready. What about um, operating a business out of your home? I'm not saying he is because he stated that his business is about a block away. However, sometimes there are certain ordinances or items that state specifically to even housing things like an automotive something out of your home. So is there aninything that speaks to that that would address? Pinellas County does have a home occupation uh, ordinance that does allow for somebody to operate a home-based business. There are provisions and conditions that um, place some limitations on those in terms of how much dedicated square foot, what type of operations, how, type of deliveries. So there are some, some ability to accommodate that. There's also a new state law, and I won't be able to cite that one as, as uh, specifically, but that is, is written um, with deference given to operating home-based businesses. And so it, it, um, it is a little bit more lenient than it has been in years prior. So there is some more accommodations of that. Is there anything within our code that says he can't have these particular items on his property? Uh, or store these items on his property until he's using them. We do get yeah. into uh, outdoor storage, uh, and again, if it, if it renders itself into that trash and debris realm, um, but as it was indicated earlier, the intent was uh, to construct the garage so that much of that can be stored within a structure. And just to give you a little context around that, I know that's not the nature of tonight's uh, decision, but to give you some context, under the current land development code, an accessory structure can be subservient to a primary structure. So the home being the primary, and I don't know the exact square footage of the Miller's home, but just to give you an example, if it was a 3,000 square foot home, you could build an accessory structure as long as it was less than mm -hmm. the primary residence. So they could build um, you know, a garage, it could have a, you know, a workshop, it could have multiple bays, as he had indicated, one for the boat, two additional for, you know, other storage materials. You could have uh, an accessory dwelling unit, other components like that, as long as the totality of that was uh, smaller than, yeah. Um, and um, as it relates to the the ability for emergency vehicles or anything of that nature to get down that corridor area so it could service either side. What is being asked for today would not prohibit that if it needed to occur. Correct, the public utility easement that's being offered as part of tonight's consideration would prevent and preclude any development or any physical structures that would impede any access. So while you would and when I want to say emergency response, that's the utility providers, not necessarily a fire truck, because what you you may recall, most fire marshals, and they are right. they do vary a little bit, but they're talking more about 20 feet right. or greater. So this would be the utility providers that would be, you know, whether that's a piece of equipment or a vehicle, they would be required to stay within that 15 foot easement. And whether or not it would increase or decrease the petitioner's property value versus the surrounding properties, that really should have no bearing on any decision made today because that's correct. That's not a criteria under which, well, under which these are these okay. are. Right. And um, the issue and concern related to the placement or replacement of the utility poles for those emergency situations for those individuals, are you satisfied that that has been done such that? those particular residents would have access, or if someone needed to come in in order to service them, they would have access? From the perspective of the easement versus the right-of-way, the dimension is the same. So from that 
vantage point, there is no difference. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Certainly. Further questions? Commissioner Seal. So if they were going to erect a fence, could they include the utility easement in their fencing or where exactly would If you're talking along 86th um, to, to prevent the, um, as was mentioned earlier, the, the unwanted um, person wandering down that space, they can provide a fence across that portion of it. They either, typically when the utility, if it's a scheduled maintenance, we know it's a pole replacement, Duke will reach out to the affected property owners and provide them notice that they're coming on the property. If it's an emergency situation, they will just take the fence down or move it, um, you know, and, and get access for that emergency need. Mr. Miller indicated to me yesterday, I'm certainly certain he'd be happy to respond to it as well. He has no intention of locking it or secure, I mean, he wants to secure it you know, in terms of closing it, both for the for safety and security, but also for the horses as well. But there wasn't an intention to padlock it or somehow prevent uh, the utility access to get into that. That's the way he described it to me. So how do you regulate that that 15-foot utility easement isn't used for storage or for other things that are already happening on the property now. It becomes an enforcement issue. Like this started, Mr. Turngren mentioned, um, we had a origination of code enforcement complaint that there was these things being stored in the right of way. And, and so um, part of our engagement with Mr. Miller in its initial phase was to educate him about what's appropriate and where this stuff. And to his credit, he moved all of those things off of that, that area, put it onto his private property portion. And we have not had a repeat of that uh, since the original involvement, but we've been going through this process. Okay, thank you. Is it, is it common to have that 15 foot, I mean, is that, that where I live in St. Petersburg proper, there is no, there's no 15 foot access for utilities. They have to come through your fences uh, in, in the suburban area. So it, how is that the norm or not the norm in residential areas? It, it is not the norm unless you have an, a, an area that has a dedicated alley system. And so in some areas of the county, you will see as narrow as 12 foot alleys all the way up to 20 foot alleys. So in that context, there is, you don't typically see alleys dead end the way that this right of way is indicated. Um, and so it is a it is a remnant piece or a you know kind of substandard piece in that regard. Further questions, Commissioner Eggers. So, so they can bring utility vehicles on there for the over the over part. What about um, is there anything that provides some kind of easement access for the residents to rep do repair on their fences? Is there anything that we can add as far as a um, you know, not from the county's perspective. So we have different types of easements. You, uh, this is what we're discussing tonight is utility easement. Right. You have drainage easements, you have public access easements, but public access easements are those they're dedicated to the entirety of the public. We can't specify those to, you know, particular specific individuals that would have to be a, a private party agreement. Let's, let's, we're, we're done with, hang on one second. Any other questions for staff from the commission? All right. What's the commission want to do? So, so what was, what was done, um, what was done last time? There was a motion to deny and it was three to two. There were two commissioners absent. I think you had canvassing that night. Um, it was three to two to three to two in favor of denial, but it was slightly different than what you mm. see tonight with the with the 15 foot. Commissioner Peters. Um, well, I have some comments. Um, the the I remember the last time um, there was a lot of debris in the alley, and I believe he had kind of a fence that he put in that wasn't allowed to be put in. Um, clearly, he's been a good steward and he's cleaned up, and not according to Blake, not used and put any property on that easement again. Um, the easement, the, the argument last time and the argument this time is the right of way. 
and he's providing the right of way. He's given it to the county. So it, to me, he's addressed the, he's addressed the concern. He's addressed the problem. Um, and I, I get that they've had it the way with them when they moved there and they don't want change, but um, um, the, the reaching the polls is, isn't an issue. I mean, he's accommodated all of the concerns that they had shown. Um, and once he does build his garage, then they won't have the visual pollution that they're concerned about um, if he's using that garage. So I, I would move to support, um, move in favor of, of, to approve this. The vacation. Yes, thank you. We have a motion I'll, by Commissioner Peters. I'll second that motion second to approve the vacation as presented by staff. Second by Commissioner Flowers. Is there further discussion? Um, just real quick, um, we ha we heard the the applicant offering something. Has that got to be between him and the property owners? That that three or three to whatever three to five feet access to repair. I think that would be as you heard described. I mean, the easement that's being offered as part of your condition here. It's for the public utility and to really to give the public access. It would be a public easement, which really defeats the purpose of the request here. So I think that would need to be between the parties. Um, and I will address the easement is provided as part of your materials here and just to address some of the concerns that I've heard raised by some of the commissioners. Uh, it specifically provides that no new structures may be installed in that easement area without approval of the grantee, which in this case is the county. Um, no new trees, so there's not going to be any sort of impediment in that 15-foot area for some of the uses that we've heard described as being necessary in there. Um, this evening, but Commissioner Eggers, to answer your question, that would need to be a private arrangement between the property owners. Yeah, okay. Um, just and just for the record, I was going back and looking at um, the, I couldn't remember the case. Well, I'm glad to know that I wasn't here, so that, that, that makes me feel better. But it does say that all five said I, so for the record, we probably ought to fix those minutes. Um, no. Uh, what? We, I'm looking at. I just, I just had uh, the vote pulled, it was three to two. Okay, well, I'm looking at minutes as well on this thing, so it says five zero. In any, in any event, um, thank you. Appreciate the answers to my question. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I just wanted to say I think that they have accommodated the complaints or the, the concerns that we were hearing. Uh, I don't hear any other concerns other than that, you know, we've been here for how many years and things have changed. And welcome to Pinellas County. I have to say, um, if I wanted to change the fence on any side of my property, I would have to work with my neighbor to do that because there is no easement there. It's on the it's on the property line. You know, good reason to stay in good relationships with your neighbors. Anyone else? All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. Show it passes six to one with Commissioner Seal. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Okay. Item 39. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item number 39 is a proposed resolution to supplement the fiscal year 2022 capital budget for unanticipated fund balances in the Star Center, capital projects, airport revenue and operating, solid waste renewal and replacement, water renewal and replacement, and sewer renewal and replacement funds as outlined in the staff report. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. I have no cards. We'll, clo we'll close the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Seal, second by Commissioner Gerard. You sure no one wants to ask Mr. Rose questions, see if he's learned the budget yet? <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. <laughs> Item number 40. Agenda item number 40 is a proposed resolution to supplement the fiscal year 2022 operating budget for unanticipated fund balances in the general fund, emergency medical services fund, emergency communications E911 fund, fire districts fund, fleet management fund, water revenue and operating fund, water renewal and replacement fund, sewer renewal and operating fund, and sewer renewal and replacement fund as outlined in the staff report. The public hearing was properly advertised. An affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. I have no cards. I see no one wishing to testify. We'll close the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Gerard. 
Second by Commissioner Long. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Show it passes unanimously. I have one. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I just for the record, I, uh, the chairman corrected me on this, and he was correct. I've missed it by <laughs> one item. So they were both 15-foot vacations, but just happened to have the wrong one. So I apologize for that miscommunication. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, Ms. Hernandez, uh, inform me that we have been here since July 21st of 2020. So uh, you want to take a piece of the carpet or wall on your way out as a memento, <laughs> feel free to do that. Uh, otherwise, we are adjourned. <laughs>